I'm, I would still be mad. So I got my pad for notes. So like if okay. we had to like come back around. I also wanted this to be more structured and forgot to communicate. You do realize you clicked the live button already, right? I did. I did. Okay. Okay. Um, I was saying we're live. You probably didn't hear me. I, I, I missed that as well. Oh, yeah. I was like, wait a minute. I see the I was like, we're live. We're live. And I guess. All right. So sorry. Anyway, we're here. We up in this thing. We up in this thing. That's about it. That's all the voice can. Uh, That's all you got. Win. Hey, Two us that like know. this. Amen, amen. All right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Brittany, amen. that was like really giving us testimony. Or were you? did you come at the end of my last slide? When I was like, when I found out Kathleen lives near a Ukrainian neighborhood and I like lost it. No. I was like, oh my God, she's near you the jelly. Like I was just freaking out giving a testimony. Anyway, before we go further, we have our beautiful um, co-host here. Uh, I'm assuming, based on what I know about Shay and Britt, that we all use she and her pronouns. I just wanted to say that. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that I like to do land acknowledgements, and I think I should just, I do it in my workplace. So I wanted to extend it to YouTube as well that I occupy the Dakota and Anishinaabe lands. So just wanted to say that as well. So now that we're going further, we're gonna let these two human beings and the dogs in the back introduce themselves. Okay, well, hey everybody, I'm Cache. My channel is Shea with the Hobbies. I write short stories, poetry, and the occasional blog post. And uh, I crochet a little bit, read a little book. So, you know, you get a little mix of everything on my channel. And these two lovely, come here, come here, puppies are uh, Titan. Titan, he's the youngest one. And then Cleo. Playing? Is this playtime now? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And then that's Cleo. So there, there's their introductions. And this one likes to take over. So as you see. There will be okay. Titan moments. There will be Titan moments. It'd be like that. It yeah. It'd be like that. <laughs> um, those of you who are in the comment section uh, and supporting us in that way, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. It's always weird for me to say that in the live, but I feel like I should just Absolutely. say that. Um, and also, please write some questions about the topic. Um, we three have decided to come together, and there are other Black creators. This is not like a monolithic kind of conversation. This also doesn't mean that there is not an expansion on this conversation or that, you know, uh, other people are missing, right? Because we can only speak from our experiences and what we know and try to be as intersectional as possible. I also want to acknowledge that we may discuss some things and might leave other intersectional identities out of the conversation, but that doesn't mean that they are not there. And I just want to take time to acknowledge those identities who are here and who are not here. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really going on my TED talk, but. No, that was, I was just thinking that was so careful and so beautiful, <laughs> such a wonderful framing for this conversation. Yeah, because mine was gonna know. be that eloquent. Mine was gonna be that eloquent. I was gonna be like, "Hey, I'm only speaking for me and nobody else in the story." Like that would have been me. So I appreciate you for being. Hey, yes, moderate us, breathe. I'm just right. saying, your girl is a therapist. <laughs> right. We all I was got like, "Ooh, it's coming out you tonight." Mm -hmm. you know, we all got different gifts. Your girl is a therapist, so it, it came out. So you know, that's that. Um, so where where should we start today? All of us With identify as black. Oh, me introducing myself. With Brit, Brit. Oh, I was about to say, Brit, let's go. Yes, I got carried away in your I eloquence. Do. I did too. I apologize. We it <laughs> no, no, no. We it's it okay. Hi, I'm Britt. My channel is Britt Writerly. It's a book and author too, where I talk about the intersections of literature and culture. I do monthly um honesty writing vlogs i do book talks um 
the very occasional sprint and also some original um, writing content like poetry. I'm on a summer schedule, so it's one to two videos a month at this point. But, you know, that's who I be. Hello, all. Nice. Let's acknowledge the people in the chat. Let's do it. Right? We got young Ashley G, right? On the ones and twos, stepping through, stepping through. We got who picked this book, AKA Nicole, sliding through our comment section. We got young Heather as well, just momming it and doing great recommendations on her channel. We got Sarah, who's just constantly supporting us out here, Sky Five Angel. And then we have Nicole once again. Nicole has two puppies. I don't know if y'all knew. Nicole has two puppies who likes to take out the squeaker. So often I hear those puppies in our lives. Then we have Shomala. Hey, on. And then we also have Nicole again. And then we have Injury from Onyx Pages who primarily just read about us. Okay. Our girl is about us. Period. Point blank, that's it. Also the originator of the Octavia Butler Slow Read. Also the originator of the Reading Sprints. And just really out here living their best. So shout out to them. And they also um, uh, is a part of, oh my God, don't don't mess up the name, Bree. Don't mess up the name. Um, read a damn book. There we go. I was like, why is it taking so long? Read a damn book by Evelyn of the Internet. And then we have Brandy. What's up? Hey, how you doing? Shout out to Brandy. Go to their channel. They have really good content. And I really like their backdrops of all those books. I don't get how people have a bunch of books in the back. Maybe because I'm just too lazy to really just step to the bookshelf. But that's my own business. All right, Alicia in here. Hey. And B in here. Hey. And those of you who's watching, cooking, and not really paying attention, but listening, hey, and shout out to you too, living your best, okay? All right. <laughs> okay, let's start our it. discussion, huh? I just love it, I love it. I have been waiting for this <laughs> since before we actually agreed to all do it. Like, this has been something I have been speaking into fruition in my head for like months hey. now. So I'm just excited. <laughs> Listen, Dorothy G. Smith, my granny says, thou shalt claim it, shall tame it. Amen. Hey. 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 Yes. Hey. 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 You know. And that's on what? Hey. 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 Oh, hey, how are you? So we have a lot of stuff to discuss. Mm -hmm. I've cleared my schedule for this. Me too. Even though I was like trying to rush and get my hair done right before. That it worked out for you. It did. I was like, that worked out for you. It has to happen. So, where would y'all like to start? I think Shay should start us off. Take us out. I like how there was no hesitation on Britt's part. Like, yeah, do that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, okay, so uh, I guess for me, the topic just came up uh, in general because so many times in like BookTube or AuthorTube, CreatorTube, on Instagram, whatever type of creation, the conversation always goes back to like the hurdles of being a Black creator, right? Like, so when we talk about like even when there's like backlash or there's something that you need to come up higher in in your content, the way that we handle that with Black creators versus creators or white creators because we don't seem to realize that there is definitely a difference in the way that we talk about these two topics has been something that's been like weighing on my heart personally and then with for those of you guys who don't know um ziggy licious on instagram and tiktok coming forward with the video showing that like you can write white supremacist or neo-nazi or anti-semitic and tiktok lets it flow but you write i am a black man or i support black excellence or anything like that black and then any other word 
automatically just dead your content and you can't post it and so for me i know we're all in different branches i'm in stem like that brings the conversation to how these apps and things are developed and what code we're using and how it puts things in the hierarchy right because we all know that our content on youtube doesn't get the same flush that other people's content is right and i know for a fact we all put black something in our tags so that black people searching for them can find them but to think about that and know that there could be that just doing that alone could be keeping your content from reaching certain people is a very scary thing as a creator right because for a lot of us we're not necessarily reaching our target audience because of that like we're getting an audience, but the people that we're wanting to encourage, the people that we're wanting to do the things for might not be the ones seeing it solely because we're specifically trying to get them. And so I, I guess that's where, where to start, I guess. <laughs> we're gonna have Britt sprinkle some, some theories on us. I like how that was just the intro. Britt come in with the theories. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I don't know. I was literally just thinking that was perfect, Shay. So I don't want to come in and be like, well, Christina Sharp says, um, because that's not. But what she said. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just thinking in general, the, I'm just thinking in general from my Africana background that we know that even though in this time, this is a moment where. And it recurs throughout history. Like people, I, I was telling Shay, it kills me over and over how in 2020 people were acting like they were discovering something that had not happened before. Um, but I think in, the, in a subtle way, that's the nature of anti-Blackness, right? To mm -hmm. always render itself invisible. And then certain people are safe in invisibility and certain people are in danger in invisibility. And so thinking about that as Black creators, um, that these these social media platforms and shake and tell us from the stem side they're inherently anti-black. The fact that you can put these tags in and that be a thing, but also the fact that you it, there's only certain times when we're allowed to grow. There are only certain times when when black creators are really going to be searched by everybody, and that's when the world is on fire. And then, and then everyone wants to talk to us and hear our stories, but only in this certain section, which is still anti-Black, because that means that we're only allowed to in exist in, the, in, in, in a time of crisis. And every other time we're to be quiet, and if we dare speak, oh, well, it's always a race thing, until it's a race thing, and then it's a race thing, right? So the, I, I just think that this conversation is important for the sake of we need to be having these conversations in and out of season, right? It's always black season for us, but in and out of season, as far as it's not just when the world is blowing up, we're black all the time. We're black women all the time. And, and wanting to make content and engage in books and support books that, that deal with us and that being even more of a struggle, me wondering if I can have um, authors on my channel and what I have to author, offer them because, well, do I have the audience for that, right? Like all of that goes into suppressing um, Black creativity and, and, and conversations about Blackness that, that try to exist outside of a model of catastrophe, right? Like we just want to talk about us being great and we have to work so much harder to even build a platform for it or and or there can only be a few of us that have that 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 larger level of success no matter how hard we grind and how many offerings we bring to the table and all of that in a word is anti-black but i'm interested i'm interested in and invested in this conversation that can tease apart that that anti-blackness and really look at like what the the mundane the mundaneity of anti-blackness right like it's not always spectacular most of the time it's not it's just every day instances of insult and, uh, and attempts of, to undermine humanity or value, worth, all of these things, right? So I'm interested in this conversation, really digging into the very discreet ways that that happens, even on a platform, even in a niche like BookTube or AuthorTube, where like, oh, we're all good and it's just books. And it's like, it's never just anything when it's Black people. And that's just the exhausting reality. Right. Yeah, so I'm going to take it and kind of 
bring it together as a beautiful Do it, Pastor. When we think about what Shay has said and also what Britt has said, we also need to be very cognizant of Black people's mental health. And if you think that these things are not wreaking havoc on Black creators' mental health to constantly have to reinvent ourselves because our creativity has now been commercialized. The way we speak has now been censored. It's just so many levels of how these things can affect our mental health. Black creators ain't on here trying to do stuff for the low, for the free. We want our coins. You understand me? We want our coins. And the fact that we cannot reach levels, reach levels as our other counterparts or, you know, our, our light, our lighter skin white people, I'm like trying to say it in a nice way, but I can't. But because there is no equity there, we're out here just running and running at a race that we are inherently disadvantaged to even like reach the top of it at all. So knowing all the things that we have talked about collectively, we cannot just talk about these things and not wonder how this is affecting a black person's pockets, their coins, a black person's mental health, and then their creativity. We have a black woman who created this thing called the nap ministry. And she talks about like how we just need to rest. But how can we rest when every time we reinvent, it get taken and then remade into something that has nothing to do with us. We see on the Ellen show how there are literally white TikTokers who are doing the dance and the renegades and no one's paying homage to young black sis who created it. So I'm saying all this to say it's like, how do you expect us to keep playing in a game when we're being taken advantage of? And if you think that that ain't leading to anxiety, depression, it could also lead to suicidal ideation. We all know how cyberbullying goes. We all know how it goes. So I'm just saying, like, we need to think of everything we're saying holistically. This is not like us up here whining, like, oh, woe is me. No, woe, my mental health. The shit matters. And that's where we're at. Right. Okay. I think even along with that, like, to be clear, we are black and creators. Being a creator, period, is an exhausting thing. Like, especially people who actually create, not copy. That takes a lot of work. And what you don't realize is a lot of these TikTok creators are copiers, not creators. And so in that, it doesn't take as much work to learn a dance that you saw somebody else come up with and redo it. Obviously, we've seen you don't even do it with the same flavor because it didn't take you that long to figure out which move went to that. It didn't take you long to remember this beat hits like this and I have to move like that. Like there is work in choreography. It's not an easy thing. Right. And so I think that when we ha when we think about it, we have to acknowledge that this thing, this avenue that we are in takes a lot of work it takes even more work to put yourself out there physically so people can see you because there's a lot of people that don't like this shade it's too dark for them like that's a hard thing to deal with and we see so many times a lot of these content creators that do get their stuff stolen aren't just black they're darker skinned black people like people who, when they say that their stuff is getting stolen, other people completely dis like don't hear them because nobody would possibly steal from you is the thought process. Like you see, we I've seen the comments and it's like those things on top of already giving of yourself artistically makes that mental health component so much bigger so much harder and then we already have to fight within our own communities about the stigmas of getting mental health help and the ability to get mental health help especially now that people can't just go to a therapist as easily as it was before like there's so many different things and it's like because we live in a society that's rooted in anti-blackness everything that happens to us is compounded by the other anti-black things that exist in this system so like yeah you might be like oh it's only content creation it's only this but it's like this affects me and everything else these people still go to school these people still work these people still have families all this affects all of those things 
And so, like, like I, I, we got on the mental health. I was like, I feel that because, like, watching these kids cry about their things, watching these kids be heartbroken about this, like, that hurts me. Like, that hurts me just to see that of other Black people. And that's something y'all, like, not y'all, but other people don't take into consideration. What it does to the other Black people trying to gain the confidence to do what they see these doing and then seeing what happens to them and thinking, well, I don't need to try. Or, well, it's just going to, I'm just, I'm not even as talented as them, so it's definitely going to happen to me. Like, because you have that imposter syndrome that everybody has that's only impacted more because of the anti-blackness in this system. It also, it also, what you just said, being black and creator and what you said and having to deal with white fragility, child, if you know, you know. Britt, take it away. I was I was just gonna say, and I my my com my comments were disabled for a second on YouTube because the devil. Um, so I it's fixed now. I think my internet was just wigging, but it's still the devil, and we recognize that and call him out and rebuke him. Um, so I was just gonna say to to bring all this together when you started earlier by being so careful and by saying just because we're not mentioning it here doesn't mean we don't see you. Like that just means that we can't speak to you and say like that. Right? Like, that was so that was so important to me to hear because I'm like that's because right there are other black people who have identities that are not represented here and we still want them to know that we're we're still talking about you and so much as we're talking about our people right and we and we want you to feel comfortable here we're calling you and we're seeing you that's important and so that's why i was just like thank you that that framing was beautiful and then when you when you were recognizing Nigerian and all of her labor on this platform that like that sort of citationality for for black women historically is not done and we do it for ourselves we always do but in seeing and seeing her comment then of saying people stealing her ideas contribute to exhaustion leads to hiatus like that's that's real that is so real and so i was just taking in all the brilliance of you of you and shay talking about and being very honest and very clear about the the detrimental effect this has on on this, on this, not just mental health, like on your psyche, on a very raw level, constantly receiving this message of of undervaluing. And when I was looking at booktubers and author tubers considering starting my platform, I literally saw a couple of goodbye videos of black female booktubers, and there was this one that literally I was like, I don't know if I should do this because, and I can't remember her name. I haven't seen her, so she's, I guess she's just like literally gone, gone, gone. But her video was her sitting on her floor painting her nails. And she was like, so this is going to be my last uh, uh, booktube video. I've been here for years. I really just feel like people don't see me or my content. And so, yeah, I'm just going to go. And feeling like you can really just disappear like that. And no one notice which we know happens to black women in all forms i mean black women did literally disappearing off the street and no one noticing and so just like just putting myself in a position where that could happen here i was like i don't know i want to i want to find community here but this is scary right like that's just right. another level i don't need in my life yeah, yeah and i I think um, one thing that like stood out to me about the the booktube stuff was when I was like trying to find like my footing in it um, was when everything was happening like last year and um, Naya from Naya Reads and Smiles had a video and she was yeah. talking about how I think it was Book Outlet who was like using like all kind of excuses not to use other booktubers and like all the things or reasons that they said were things that Naya herself had done on her channel and she was like no it's not that you don't accept those things because all even these white creators that you use do these same things it's like anti-black and I remember seeing that and being like, yo, like these companies are kind of blatant with it. And it was like, mm -hmm. like, and when she did the video, she was like, I don't know if they forgot 
that I was there and I was black. Like, no, like I I exist in this place. And I remember being like, yo, that is insane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like that mm -hmm. is insane that you don't think that in these circles, we don't all see each other. So you don't think that I see like, oh, wow, there's another black person in this community that you are choosing to highlight. Let me reach out as another black creator because it seems like you like diversity. And then telling me that what I see all these other people do that I do on my channel is inappropriate. But why is it inappropriate? And it's like the realization that companies require black creators to jump through hoops that they don't require our counterparts to do is frustrating. Yep. Yep. And that, that made me think of when, what Injury was saying. That made me think of that because I was like, I remember first seeing her booktube sprints and seeing those and like her finding her channel and being excited because she was the only black person I found that was just reading black people. And mm -hmm. I remember feeling like, because that's me. Like I read some books written by white people, but like, everybody reads books written by white people and so for me i was just like i don't want to do that because everybody does that yeah and i watched her channel and she's naming authors i have never heard of and i'm like i got a list on my fridge i have read 30 black authors i've never read in my life since following her channel yeah Only four of them are from that list I still got a whole list of people I haven't even touched. And so like that, that I saw on her channel, like inspired me. And then to know, like she's putting in this work, like I got a, a message about her Octavia E. Butler slow reads from like Eventbrite. Like it's that big of a deal. Yeah. And then to know that people are like pushing like her content down and her desire to create, like that hurts because she definitely drew me into this community, you know? Yeah. And like, again, to think about what you're doing to one person, it affects a lot more of us than you even realize. Right, right. I wanna talk about, um, I wanna get to the question, but I wanted to clear up two things. One, when Britt was saying, you know, black women can just be missing off the streets, um, and like no one cares about them. And in regards to the the video that you saw and the girl was just like, no one's watching my stuff, no one's engaging, right? It also made me think of all the missing and murdered indigenous women who's also been missing and have not been found and have been murdered. So I also like to like pay um, close attention to that as well. Cause I think a lot of times the black and the indigenous experiences is intersectional historically and currently right now. So I just wanted to address that. And the second thing is I can understand how you can just be going about your regular day and, you know, just existing as you are and make a mistake. And when you get feedback that the mistake has been made, if you're not actually engaging in change agents, I just don't know what to say about that. And I say that to say um, a while back, um, I did not give Njiri her props. And to this day, I feel bad about it. I've apologized about it and everything. So now I make it a point to be like, Njiri does this, does that, and does this because I don't want to contribute to the narrative that black women don't have a voice and that black women are not owed their coin and they're not owed their retribution. It's bullshit, it's sad, and it's disgusting. So I don't want to continue that. So I say all that to say, if you are profiting off of a black woman and you have been told or you know that it's not okay, you need to make that public and you need to apologize and you need to figure out a way to move forward because contributing in that narrative is so toxic to the black woman and it's it's not even excusable. So I don't know, That's that was my TED talk there. Um, did y'all have any? I just wanna piggyback on that because I feel like this is something we don't talk about enough. Apologies one don't have to be accepted Speaking and saying the words i apologize 
don't fix issues. Speak like change truth. fix issues. And I think that like that has become a thing that when people get called out, it's like, well, I apologize. Okay, yes, but what are you doing to make amends and to change this behavior? Like I was taught that in order for forgiveness to actually happen from other people, you have to show them that you meant that apology. There has to be work behind it. And so like if you are doing these things and it's like, I, I feel like what we've always seen or even like last year, like everybody got a black square up. It's a year later. What have you done since that black square? Right. What? How have you changed? Right. Uh, you were highlighting black creators for like two months. It's a year later. Why are you not still highlighting black creators? And like there's different. Bio is not it. Right. It's not the same anymore. Right. It's like it's yeah. these things to to do these things properly. It has to be consistent. It's not a one time thing, and it sucks, right? Because it's a lot of work but it still needs to be done right yeah. because we ha- we have to do a lot of work whether we want to or not it's still a lot and we do it anyways and so we're just asking for that same and i think that a lot of times we get apologies and no work behind it and people are still like well you we they apologize what else do you want them to do change be better do better hold other people accountable yeah keep that same energy you know stuff like that And I think it's hard, like as a therapist, um, I find people have a really hard time with engaging in conflict because it depends on how you were raised and your upbringing and which conflict has been introduced to you. What's conflict introduced to you yelling and screaming and calling you everything but a child of God? Like was conflict was coming towards you as a place of I feel this way when you do this. How can we solve this? Right? So people just just put conflict in one bubble as just fire and not understanding, like, if I tell you you did something that I didn't like, let's figure out how we can mend this and not be on the defensive, like, oh, no, but you did. It don't matter what the fuck I did yesterday. I'm telling you right now in this situation that it was harmful and what actionable steps that we need to do to rectify this. And to also piggyback on what Shay says, you can say, I'm sorry a thousand times and nobody has to hear you. Nobody has to be like, okay, I accept it. No, you don't have to. You can say, okay, you're you're cool. I ain't trusting you no more. (laughs) You know, like, so it's really, it's just one of those things. I'm going to go to the question, our first question. What kinds of things do you have to do to get your content seen versus white creators? For me, and I, I have the smallest platform here. So I, and I just celebrated my like year anniversary. So like that's that framing. Um, we've been hearing. Do you know what today is? It's, uh, it's our anniversary. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Hey, send the shoulders. Um, so but for me, I am still cracking that code. And I like I I heard people say a lot when I first started that YouTube algorithm is tricky. Can confirm. And at this point for me, it's not even like what kind of things I have to do to get my content seen versus white creators i am i have stopped trying to figure it out because that's not why i got on the platform i have to be considerate of those things but i saw someone else talk about um mental health and protecting your mental health like what videos do we not see not watch for me there are certain things i just don't even engage with like it would be great to get to where I can get and get monetized to watch some of all those things. Right? Like it would be great, but I want to get there doing my content. I am a black woman with a master's in Africana pursuing a PhD in Africana. Okay. I'm going to do content that that pulls to a, a critical race engagement. And if that, and like I'm going to do it any month of the year I want to. So if that, if people are not clicking on that, but only on February and during Kwanzaa week, and it takes me longer to get there, I don't care because my mental health is secure when I know I'm doing these things for myself. Even when the watch time isn't coming in, 
I feel better that way. And so I don't even look at like versus white co content creators anymore. For me, that's why it was important to, to connect with people like Shay, with people like Brie, with people who, who I can just rock with no matter what my platform numbers are and who like, we're just, we're just talking and seeing each other and whatever. So for me, it's for me, it is less about the numbers, they matter. And I, and I'm not gonna, like, I don't see it, but I don't put a premium on it because that is not a sustainable model for me as a black woman, because I will constantly be brought back to, well, that's just the devaluation of content when I'm talking about, when I'm talking about citationality of, of black, of black women's intellectual history, when I'm talking about black privacy, right? When I'm talking about these things that are really, really important right. and the numbers don't show up, if I'm like, well, white creators, well, white creators ain't doing this. Let's just say it. White creators are not doing this. So I can't expect them to expect to have the same views as them. If everything I do, no tea, no shade, is not a tag or a what or, or whatever white creators are doing. To be quite honest, I don't know what they're doing. I'm not watching them like that. But whatever they're doing, I know that they're not doing what I am because I'm working out of my expertise. And so I don't even bother trying to compare because I, I don't want to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, I wasn't laughing at you. Sartre said tricky is a weird way of saying racist, and it took me out when I saw it. So that's what made me giggle. It just made me laugh. I was I'm like, no, no, no. Made me laugh. the foolishness. It just made me laugh. Um, <laughs> for me, um, is is very similar. So honestly, um, I came in through AuthorTube. AuthorTube is way more white than BookTube. Um, legitimately, I think we have four people, four black people monetized, like over a thousand, and I'm one of them. And that just happened that it happened to three of us or two of us, it happened within the last year. So it is not a lot of us that are in that. And so my introduction into Author 2 was just a bunch of white people and Lizelle Sanberry. Shout out to Lizelle Sanberry, author of Blood Like Magic. It came out June 15th. If you haven't read it, you should go check it out. It is, it's good. Me and Britt did a whole talk on it last month. We loved it. So yeah, definitely go check it out. Support our black writers, especially like off the tube, YouTube, like she's one of those, right? Um, but anyways, uh, in doing in creating my channel, the first video I ever did was like the booktube tag. Now, mind you, I didn't do not one booktube video that year, but it's okay. Um, it was like what I had seen because every time I typed in black booktuber, I saw nobody. And until I put out my booktube tag was when I started seeing black people. That's when I found Naya. That's when I found Njiri. And I didn't even find you, Brie, until Brit. And when Brit told me, the first thing I did was go and subscribe. Because I had never, and she was like, no, she's been putting out these videos. And I don't know why she's not monetized. She's doing the work. And I like went and I was like, oh, she is doing the work. Because I, I ain't got these many videos and I do lives. It wasn't even a thing. Like... And so for me, like Brit, it's like, I can't try to do what y'all do because it don't even interest me. Like, I don't like the same stories y'all like. I don't like the same books y'all like. And so trying to like make myself fit into it was never gonna work. Uh, and luckily for me, I, I do, again, this is luck. Um, a very big white author tuber found my channel and liked my content and she started shouting me out and my numbers started rising. Um, all I was doing was being me, right? And that's all that I could do. And even when it came out, like, I don't know what to tell y'all. I don't know what to expect. Like, I think I had maybe done four videos. All I had done at the time was live. So it's like, don't be expecting new content. And then I got into this habit of because I had these new people feeling like I had to do more and had to be more. And even that was exhausting because what people don't realize when we have these big waves of people coming to follow us out of nowhere it changes the expectations of what they want and what they do. Like when people are always like, oh, let's it, it's it's Juneteenth. Let's shout out all these black owned businesses. But these are smaller owned black owned businesses who now are getting flooded with all these customers that they don't know how to handle because they've never had it. And then now we got people putting bad reviews because, oh, they're not working as fast as we want them in. Well, 
you guys, because all of a sudden you're trying to feel better about yourself, you have raised this person's profile. And yes, that's awesome. That's great. But you're not thinking about what the effects that has on this person when they're getting bad reviews because they just can't handle the sheer volume of it. Or like y'all are subscribing to a bunch of black creators, but because y'all don't really like our content, you're not really watching. So the watch time hours don't match the number of subscribers that we're getting. Like those are things that like, when you're doing these um what do we call them like these bandwagon things yeah, you don't think yeah. about how those affect us because we don't create the same content and it takes from us in a different way than it does so like for me like how do i what do i have to do i'm just cachet because i i can't I, I i honestly like me personally it's already youtube is already mixed company for me and so to have to do anything extra or more to make myself more palatable would be an even harder thing for me to do mentally. And so I'm not going to do it because yeah, yeah. as much as I like this, there's only so much mental stress I'm going to let it create in my life. Come because on, I, come I just can't do it. I, I just can't. Because, again, it don't pay that well. I know we, we monetize and you think it don't pay that well. It don't. It I'm don't. still having you got my job. I just got mine. I got monetized. I think we both got monetized like November, December time frame. Yeah. I think I just reached a hundred last month. Child. And you put out way more content than I do. I thought you put out way more content. Than no, you. I am not at all as good and as consistent as you. The only thing I do is lives. Like I do a live, <laughs> but outside of that, like you actually sit down and do your videos. Cause like for me, it takes a lot. But more so because I'm writing. And so, like, I'm already creating. And it's like creating on top of creating is a lot of freaking work. Not to say anything about books because I'm not trying to diminish that on anything. But it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's multiple mindsets. And it's just like, it's a lot. It's a lot yeah. of work. And I don't. Mm -mm. My question to this is, if I'm being 100% honest, when I first came into BookTube, I was a Peace Corps volunteer chilling in Ukraine. And I said... I'm sure there's some YouTubers who like to talk about books. Had no idea, did a little search. Only white women, young white women came up. So when I kept searching, I used to complain to one of my best friends um, who's also white. And I was like, booktube is just so white. Like I just came do it. There's like no black people at all. And they were like, actually, I follow Onyx Pages. Have you heard of her? And that is how I got hooked up with Onyx Pages and then Bookish Realm and then Naya Reads and Smiles and like, you know, those people. And then I was like, well, BookTube also seems like a young person's game, right? So I was like, your girl got to be 21 and out here just crying in every thumbnail. Like, is that what I got to do to, to get a view. And I was like, nah, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. So what it boiled down to is me realizing, not realizing, but me really understanding in the context of book two, that your girl is not white. I'm not going to wake up white. Um, I don't go to bed white. I don't know how to exist white. Right. And that's based on my perception of what I think whiteness is. So it, it boiled down to me like Cache and Brett having to have other black creators tell me, just create what you want, C create what you want, because that didn't come as firsthand to me as it did to you two. But like y'all and other people keep saying like, create what you want, create what you want. So now I try to do like, book reviews based off mental health, which I really like, but it doesn't, it doesn't get views, but I'm okay with that. Cause I feel like some black person is watching this and like, man, maybe I should go to therapy, which I'm all about. <laughs> like, yo, we, we need to go see somebody. So for me, when you think about like my content versus white creators content and what do I have to do? I'm just out here. Like I've been stagnant. I think I'm at like a thousand and seven hundred eighty ish subscribers. I've been here for like three months. Not a skip in sight. 
But for me, I feel good because I feel like I'm doing content that I want to do. I stopped doing tags because I felt they were so draining and I just couldn't do it anymore. So it's just like, you really just got to do whatever you want to do and mind your black business. So um, that's that's really what I'm out here doing, just minding my black business. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to mind your black business. My black business. Come on. So I don't I have know, time. And I, I don't want to mind a business that pays me. Hey. Does that you always miss the booktube conversations on Twitter? Because it'd be conversations about books I don't even, like, that aren't even on my radar. And I'd be like, oh, these are dumb. Those aren't even black books. That's why I don't know about it. Oh, Errol, you didn't hear me. about that? Sure didn't. <laughs> no, no. You stop mm -hmm. minding your business. You know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> next question. We just talked about TikTok's obvious anti-blackness. Have you seen or had the work around similar or different kinds of intolerance on YouTube, other platforms you use? Um, have you seen or had work around similar? So or the anti-blackness that i've seen on youtube has been more community wise than like individual like app things that i've seen um but that's been for me but that's also been because i personally haven't like took the time to look at different things so i haven't like done a video and put like tags that didn't have black in them and tags that have black in them to see like how different the videos have done so I, I haven't tried that but i know in the community wise at least with part of the reason why i like separated from author tube was that there was so much like animosity about a black creator growing so fast like as i was growing whenever i would have a stream it would constantly be white people constantly like oh your numbers are going up oh your numbers are going up oh your numbers are going up and for me it was never something i would watch because if I did, it would become something I would obsess with. And so I just didn't pay attention to it. It was just like, I'm just doing what I do and it comes as it comes. And so then when people, when people say it in a stream, you can't act negative about it because then that gives a negative connotation. So you're kind of like, oh, thank you, you know, being gracious and blah, blah, blah. But then like it became a thing where it was just drama. And it was like in the community, I had never done anything to make anyone feel negatively about me publicly. Like that had never been a thing. But because somebody who was white came and was crying and saying negative things about me with no proof whatsoever, I saw in a day I went down like 200 subscribers from like one video. And I was like, are y'all serious? Like this person just got on screen and just started saying stuff and like y'all just ate it up. And so like that night I held my regular live stream and I just, I'm cachet, so receipts, receipts, receipts. I don't know what this person is talking about. We have never had a negative conversation. I don't know why she has, you see this? Hi, hello, how are you? I think you're awesome. I think you're awesome. Do you see any beef? I don't see it. So I don't know where it came from. And that took me a long time to even want to create with white creators again, because the bandwagon in which people who had never seen anything to do this like because even in the comments of her stream were like dang i didn't know she acted like that she always seemed so nice i never saw it right because that's not how you see me act but the way in which people jumped on it so fast was like wait a minute like this doesn't make sense this doesn't like because had i done this to her it would have been a very big deal. Like, and then we go on, the community went on and everybody acted like it didn't happen. Act like she didn't lie. Act like she didn't call the group of black people in the community a, a mafia. Like, act like she didn't group. Like, these were le legitimate things. Like, called the other black people, uh, what it was, it wasn't flunkies. It was like, um. Minions? Like, yeah, minions or something like that. Like, something like that. Like, they were like an attack group. And I was like, even the language in which you used to describe us was negative. 
You don't describe any other group of white authors in this community as a mafia, as a gang or nothing. But when you see us, that's what you do. And so even having that conversation and talking about it and then the way it was swept under the rug, like the black people are just creating was like, this is a very anti-black situation. And the fact that nobody saw what we saw and everybody was like, it's not that big a deal was like enough for me to step back and be like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I just need to go to something completely different because I don't want to be a part of a community that doesn't support everybody in the community. Right. That doesn't call out stuff. Right. Y'all, they, they, they did a whole thing where they went off, went after a girl because she was charging people for arts. So y'all can get up in arms about that and not get up in arms about blatant racism. Right. There's something right. wrong with that. The math ain't math. Ain't math. Right. Literally, it was gonna say. say. And, I, and I, I hear an echo. I hope that no one else hears it. We do. Um, I think we should all mute ourselves. Yeah, I'm mute myself. myself. Talking. Okay. And it's gone. Well, okay. The STEM people in my life. I thank you. Um. But so I what that brings up for me, Shay, is just the vulnerability of being black and a creator. Like, you ain't got no chances to mess up for you out of here. It can be made up. It doesn't matter. You don't have no chances before we trying to shoot you out of here. And it's just like, it, and it can be for like, it, like you perceive the real insults. If we do mess up, we don't get to mess up. We don't get to apologize and change. You're always going to be what you did. It can be something that was literally created and powered by white tears are us. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And it's just like that vulnerability is another um, just mental, like that, that calculation is tiring. That calculation is tiring about, do I speak on this thing or do I say this? (laughs) <laughs> white tears are us yes um like that that calculation is, is tiring of if i do this video what's the kickback gonna be or i don't know how many people how many white creators i'm trying to know because i'm trying to, I ain't trying to catch no drama like if that calculation is just tiring and people i don't think that that non that that white creators think about the calculus of being um, a creator of color, a black creator specifically for this conversation about always having to do the math on how what you do or how that video or anything is going to land. Even when we have the right to be mad and black people have the right to be pissed. Every day if I wake up pissed, it is none of your concern and it's justified. But I can't get on my platform and live in that or read books that validate that because, oh my gosh, you're always so angry and like there are good things in the world too, like all all of this. So I just think just like the vulnerability of, of black creators constantly having to look over your shoulder or wonder if this thing is gonna be the thing that finally gets you and feeling like you have to find community to have your back or else you're a target. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous. Sometimes you gotta say, excuse my French, Fuck the math. You just gotta just say fuck the math and choose violence. You just sometimes the pressure of being black and being a black creator and being yeah. a black person and being a black woman and being of this age and X, 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 the the way it's compiled in the social, the social um, I guess you could say like effects of it. It's just too damn much. So sometimes you got to just say, fuck the math. And one time on Instagram, somebody had the caucasity to call me aggressive. My response was, don't you ever call a black woman aggressive. Period. Fucked up was my response. And I know that's not really how I like to operate, but... I had to choose violence because my patience was that thin that day and I didn't have time for for what my mom says, a bitch and they mammy. I did not have time. So I'm saying that doing the math is draining. It's hard. Jesus. So sometimes I'd be like, I ain't never seen a calculator a day in my goddamn life. And I'd just be like, fuck it. Calculus, I don't know her. Never met her. Never met her. 
don't know her or her people. It's no. funny because like no, like people don't think about that. Like I, I remember I did not want to work with a creator because I felt like everything she did was performative. And she had made a post about Juneteenth, and it was kind of like low key her trying to shame and brag to other white people about having like celebrated Juneteenth all of her life or majority of her life. And so being the petty betty that I am, I was like, you've been on Instagram for a while. Let's just scroll. No Juneteenth 2019, no Juneteenth 2018, no Juneteenth 2017, no Juneteenth. So you ain't never celebrated it. Okay, cool. I'll give you one better. Black History Month is 30 days. You in 28 days. I'll give you a whole month. Let's see if you post anything February, any of these years. And she had it. And I legit was like, I want to tell her that I don't want to work with her and I want to be specific because I don't want you to not have the valid reason. But then I was like, but how do I tell her? Because I don't want to tell her. And then she go back to somebody else. And this person said, Cache said she wouldn't work with me because I'm just not all into the black stuff like she is. Or because that's another thing that you have to be aware of as a black creator is anything that you say can and will be used against you. And so even having to think about that, having to write three different ways and how I wanted to say it to make sure it came off right and it was respectful and it was like, not like we can't create in the future, but once I see that this is something that is a part of your life and not performative, I would be happy to collaborate with you. But right now I'm just not comfortable. And even the backlash from just saying, I'm not comfortable with working with you, not saying you are a bad person, this just doesn't feel okay to me. That should be something everybody is allowed to say, period. But black women, when have there have been a time historically where our boundaries have been protected and our boundaries have been uh, respected? So this is what I'm saying, choosing violence. I just think it's interesting how white creators on book two in the book community will throw that ass back for Shara J. Mass. Will throw it back. You understand me? But can't do that for black creators. I don't get it. it, it and we'll it. admit that Sarah J. Mass's books are not even that good. I'm like, oh, so we're saying that white mediocrity is better than black excellence. Can we preach on that? Did you hear what you just said? White mediocrity is going to take all your money, but you won't. You would rather choke before you read a good black book. I mean, didn't Chris Rock say you can be white and have a C plus average and be the president of the United States? Well, I remember one time being a part of this uh, this um, panel with women of color and all of us are scholars in our own regard, right? And it's everyone in the audience were women of color. So they're asking questions like, how do you combat imposter syndrome? What did that look like to you? Like, how do you go to what Shay referred to earlier as spaces with mixed companies and how do you thrive? Like, how do you, how do you do it, right? So then this woman of color, she goes every time, imposter syndrome, try to sneak up in my head. I look in the mirror and I yell, mediocre ass white men don't feel this way. And I have never let that escape this brain, ever. I was legit talking about that this morning, like, and it was with just other women, but in general, like as a business major, that was something that we were constantly told was that like the issue with women in applying for jobs is women want to make sure they have 90 to a hundred percent on that list of stuff before they'll even apply. A uh, man will see they have 65% and be like, I bet they'll hire me and ask for more money than what's listed. Like, it's a completely different mindset on top of that. So then add being a person of color on top of that. Like, be, being Black and a woman, man, just come on now. It's a lot. And to not acknowledge it is is a travesty. And look, he 
Oh, it's deceitful because oh. you're acting, you're acting like everybody else had these same hurdles to go through. You're acting like the playing field is exactly the same, and these people just aren't reaching it because they're not good enough, and that's not it either. There's also this certain China, and I don't know if I'm wrong for saying this, but this is just how I feel. I feel like the book community only really wants a certain type of black woman. Can you can you walk down my street, Pastor? I just can feel like for the in the back. I just feel like none of us got the right hair color. None of us got the right pattern. We sitting on the four and up. You understand what I'm saying? So I feel like we are not even, you know, your girl thicker than a snicker over here, okay? Thunder thighs, amen. I don't know about you, Britt. I don't know about you, Shay. I'm on I'm, I'm on the committee. This girl is blessed. Over I'm here. A little, I'm, I'm a little I'm a little big. <laughs> and those of us with a dumpster truck behind that thing is not the target audience. And I'm just saying, I just feel like us three as collective and individual are not the type of blackness that is accepted. And then if we go a step further, when you get to what we talk about, it's not the version of blackness that's going to make you comfortable. No. Nope. Because none of our channels is going to make you comfortable if you are anti-black at all. Oh, yeah. Like, you you are all going to, yeah, you're not going to. So... If you are like, oh, they not my never my cup of tea, and then you try, you eh, sometimes. I remember when we were sitting when me and Britt had started writerly conversations, and we both were talking about um, just how much we personally don't see black romance talked about, and how I was like, we were both like, this is gonna be a controversial topic for people, even though for us it's not a controversial topic. Right? It's not. It just is. Like, it just it is. is a topic. But like, it was like a. We ready to do it. Let's go all in. Like, either they're going to feel it or they don't. And right. majority of the comments, of course, are Black people who have been wanting to have the same conversation because we've all been seeing it in everything. And it's been something that if you are not Black, you probably weren't noticing. Right. Right. Because it doesn't Or we're thinking that. that the interracial romance was enough, and that was the exact right. opposite of what we were saying. Yep. And this has been happening for over a year now. Charles, right? Is that books on stereo, Charles? Is that I think so. their name? That's yeah. what I saw people calling them in the comments. Yeah, oh. I thought I thought I saw them calling them Charles. Exactly. But this right here, but all the white people love some Meg the Stallion. Not enough Yo. to listen to her lyrics and make an accurate dance to it, but we're not gonna talk about that. Listen. When I literally did a video on my channel on Malcolm X, Megan Thee Stallion, and misogyny. And it was around when, I, what was, I forget what of what which of my like series it was on. I think it was like misquotations or something. Oh, hmm? I thought it was the T one, maybe not. No, it was before I, the T one started. It, it was, oh yeah, my honesty, no, it was, it was a little bit before then. It was like, basically like misquotations. Um, and when people were, people love talking about Malcolm X, like black people come back in cycles. Zora Neale Hurston is back up. Octavia Butler is back up. Like we, we come in cycles. Um, but people were, were saying that Malcolm X quote about the black woman is the most unprotected, disrespected person in America, all this on the third. They love saying that. And then Megan Thee Stallion gets shot and it's a punchline. I you said, so this is people. how you can hmm? even our own people. That's what, no. well, that's really what I was talking about. It's like, so this is how you can misquote something just in your life, even if you're not reading, and maybe even especially because you're not. You over here walking and walking antagonistically to this quote that you're saying, like, oh well, black women are all disrespected, but it's shot girl summer. But, like black women are always get called in as the motor for culture as the motor for for art, for creation, for articulating boundaries. Like we get called in to do that labor. You cite us, you t like all of these things. But then when that when when we get violated, it's either not talked about at all or it's a game. 
like our lives, our bodies are a game and you just come into our lives and choose what you need and then you bounce. And I'm just like, when I, when I saw Magnify in the comments, I was like, ooh, because I don't, and I don't know if the person was a troll and that's really what's sad about it. I would rather them have been a troll. But after I have this 16 minute video going through the history of Malcolm X's sermon, the sermon, his, um, it was really a eulogy. The history of that of that that um, speech, the history of Malcolm X's interaction with black women, like after all of that, someone comes into the comments and says, "So what exactly are black women not protected from again?" You know, kills and violence. What you have to choose is to not be stupid. I would have been like comments like this. Com com unprotected comments like this. You have to choose intelligence. Like you can't you 16 minutes and you still refuse. I said, listen, Google is not an educator. And I believe that to this day, but it is free and it is a starting point. Ooh. You can type in black women violence and have thousands of directions to go in in any category. And literally, it, it doesn't even have to be trafficking, prison. Although we could go there, it could be education. It could be domestic violence. Like you could choose, you could choose seemingly innocent things like education and find black girls getting getting code violations that their white counterparts don't get. Right? Like you can find it anywhere. Getting sent home for wearing a tank top. Exactly. Like. Huh? Even even you can even take it a step further. I was reading a the root article this morning about colorism, and even that, even if you go even deeper, the differences between how dark skinned girls are punished in schools versus lighter skinned black girls. Like there is so much that is anti black, and the closer you are to being that black, the worse it gets. Yeah, I went to a high school where. It went, uh, and I'm not going to say what, but um, I used to get in trouble a lot for fighting boys because if no one has not known that oftentimes femininity, femininity is not associated with a black woman, right? We're mostly associated with being masculine or not being woman. So I've always been tall. I've, I've not always been this thick, but I've always been tall. So people specifically young boys when I was young would want to fight me. And one time I got into this fight, the principal in this, uh, it was a light skinned girl, a part of the fight too. She's also black but light skinned. He just gave her a good old, you know, two day suspension and beat me with a paddle. So I say all these to say, these things are very much true. And like, it's just, Oh, you know, I just, I laughed on this. I just wanted to say not a single hand on this. Do you know how <laughs> mad I was? Like, at first it was funny. And then it was like, and y'all say y'all a good generation. Y'all can't even follow instructions. Like y'all really want us to be proud of Gen Z. And for me, it's the lack of being able to follow instructions that worries me. Y'all was just eating Tide Pods a few years ago, and now you can't listen to a song and do the lit. Like, it just, I mean, I know they got some good things going for themselves in Gen Z, but it's not to say I'm not still worried. The Tide Pods? I'll be honest, it took me out. <laughs> no, yo, when I was like, are they seriously having board? Like, they're voting on how to change Tide Pods so they don't look as in, enticing, I was done. I was like, you know what? When I was a kid, washing your mouth out with soap was a threat, not something we actively tried. That's all I'm saying. No, my granny was queen of washing your mouth out with soap. I'm like, Dorothy G. What? Oh, for the love of Christ. Um, I do want to make a, a small comment earlier, Margaret, um, put on here the book by Iojima Olua called Mediocre. You guys, if you have not read that book, please do. 
like the author goes through history, historically. She starts from when the colonizers came here, what they did to his to indigenous folks, all the way down to the present, and how mediocre white men have historically got away with violence and continue to get away with violence. So I'm saying that to say, please read that book. Um, we're gonna come here. Was it Khadija um, Mumbwe that explored the Shonda Rhimes interracial couple standard? Yep, they did. Why not black couples? It was checked five months ago and really thoughtful. Yes, they did. I haven't seen that, but yeah, no. Like that, that for me, and like I don't shame anybody for watching, but it's why I've never finished uh, Shonda Rhimes like season or show. Like I think I might have got close to finishing the first season of How to Get Away with Murder, but I just, for me personally, especially as a dark skinned black woman, I don't like seeing the tropes of dark skinned black women that I hear all the time. Like as someone who's had to deal with sexual assault and things like that, having to hear this, like you probably wanted it and you know y'all can't control yourselves and then seeing it on screen. And unfortunately for us, so many people that don't look like us use these representations for what they think we do and we act like because this is what they see and because they see it, it has to be true. It comes back negatively for those of us who have to live the experience. And so for me, I just don't entertain it. And I've had like people get upset. It's like, no, like I love to, so I want to support other black people all the time. Fortunately for me, it's enough of y'all supporting Shonda that she ain't gonna get mad that I'm not watching. So we it's cool. She ain't, gonna, she ain't gonna trip. She ain't gonna trip. But for me, and also for me, I personally, I can't abide being okay with not seeing what created me. Two black people created me. I wouldn't be here without two black people. And so for me, it makes me feel good to see it. I don't care what they look like or whatever, but it just, it instills a sense of pride in me. And so for me, it's just, that's what I focus on. And I hate that when the conversation is that like, hey, this is interracial romance if it's a black person and a non-black person. Like, that's okay. Those need a space. Those people need to see their love value too. But that yeah. doesn't mean I still don't need to see mine. They need their own space. They don't need to take over this space. They need their own thing. We, there's, we got enough room for everybody to eat, live, and see themselves represented. Why do we keep making it like we don't? Now that was a word. And it was also very inclusive. I'm like trying to think of a better word. Like, cause like Charles were talking about the debate in the black community on in the book community was like people getting upset, like, oh, I wanna read interracial or I wanna do this. And it's like, listen, I'm not saying that interracial couples in a book romance that love is not valid that is exists in the real world and it definitely needs to be celebrated and seen but also black love also exists in the real world and needs to be celebrated and seen like just because i'm saying you know i don't see black love you getting all up in arms about it because you're in an interracial relationship when it's like you're not quite reading the room like you right. should. You didn't say black people couldn't be in love. That's not what we said. That's, right. That's not what we said. Right. Like, we didn't say that your relationship doesn't exist. We didn't say that either. Like, and as well, someone who's the majority of my nieces and nephews are biracial, I completely get the reason for them needing to see couples that look like the family they have. Right. But then I also have nieces that are dark like me that don't need to see every dark skinned black girl with a white guy as if they have to dilute their blackness. Like that's not something they need to always see. Or that they, is the only option. Right, right. That doesn't need to be the only option for them. And that's the only thing that I've ever thought. Because like for me, as a dark skinned black woman, when I was a kid, I would constantly see dark skinned black women with people lighter than them. And as a child, it made me think 
that that was the only acceptable option for me because I was so dark. Because Which I was constantly blackness. Right. And yes. so like now I'm older, I get it, I understand, but I also understand that children don't get that. Children don't understand that. So when they see these are things they internalize, that they don't know why they're internalizing it that way. That's just what they see. If we can do anything to increase the positivity they see when they look at themselves, when they see people that look at them, why wouldn't we do that? Right. Right. And I'll take it even further. And I was, Jen, we've had this conversation, um, Cache, and I was just talking to my colleague about it today. For me, it, it's all the things that that Shay and Bree have already said, and we had we had this conversation no longer form in our first early conversation back in February about interracial um, romances as black erasure. And for me, that's what I'm concerned with. Not the fact that you're in an interracial relationship. Find your joy. Don't care. You're being respected, protected. Hey, we love it for you. We love it for you. For me, I'm like, but but consider the source. Do we trust publishing this much? What's going on? Do we really think there's not a reason interracial relationships are trending? What's going on? Like, you we can't be trusting the source like this when we know we know the source code. We know we're in the matrix. So why are we even fighting about it anymore? There's a reason it's trending. And and to add on to because Shay's already said this. So what what I want to add is when I see specifically in fantasy because Cache is mostly contemporary, I've been needing to escape in the second worlds. So I think there's more there's more black love in contemporaries and fantasy. I see so many interracial you, like you see that dreaded and ridiculous love triangle, and then I see. I see that there is um, absolutely Black Pearls Club, um, and then I see that, that that both of the that both the people in the triangle are white, and then I don't see and uh, and on top of that, like I see this black girl who's given the option of two white guys, and it's the way they get described that like concerns me because it's very like his blonde hair and his blue eyes and his fair skin. And I'm like, that's concerning because it just reads like you're glorifying his whiteness. And then both of the guys you happen to, to not to like, to not be able to keep yourself away from are white and nary a black boy in sight. That is what concerns me because then I'm like, so there are these wonderful black boy fantasies coming out. Tristan Strong punches a hole through the sky. Love that for middle grade. Rage of Dragons by Evan Winters. Wrecked my life, but I love that for, for, for fantasy, right? But like, so when they're not the protagonist, can they not still be in the story? Can they not still be deserving of love? Like if we, like, can they not still be in the world? And that's one of the reasons that Wings of Ebony was so important to me because both of the love interests were black boys. I said, yes, can we see them? Like, what does it say when we have black boys reading fantasy and they don't see themselves or as, as desirable? When we talk about black girls being made to feel undesirable, you're either hi hyper masculine or hyper sexualized, but black boys get, get, get pointed as hypersexual or they don't exist at all. You're yeah. only here to be hyper violent and hypersexual. If you're not doing those things, be gone. And it's troubling when I see that happen with black writers as well. Black writers having all the love interests be white boys. And I'm like, well, mm, can, can we just consider the, the history of that? Can we just consider the history of that? And, and Jerry, I completely agree with this. I thought how they handled that was amazing. Absolutely. I appreciated the conversation. I like tweeted about it afterwards. Like, this is how you deal with backlash. backlash. And I feel like they didn't get enough props on how they properly handled it. Because so many times we see people, like we talked about earlier, do the little hiatus and not talk no more mm -hmm. and wait for it to blow over and then come back and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Also, let me give a shout thing. out again to, um, not again, sorry, I didn't, I didn't do it before. I want to give a shout out to Black Pros Book Club 
Um, they have a uh, YouTube, if y'all don't know, and please subscribe. They have good panel discussions, I think so. Um, there's more panel discussions to come. I'm like just waiting, <laughs> waiting on the yeah, topic. So I can schedule yesterday's for this coming Sunday because they were okay. supposed to happen yesterday, and I think they rescheduled it for this. Coming okay, Sunday. I was like, there's some coming, so be on the lookout for that. Also, um, uh, I want to give a, another special shout out to Brittany, um, and her page is uh, Melanin Eclectic. And she does all like the the fantastical, you know, Canva like what is it? Like, how do you describe it? You know, people design the designs. Yeah, she got yes. stickers, her Definitely. reading journal is amazing. I have one. It's amazing. Amazing. And her and Jerry just did a collab where they're yeah. like doing washi tape. Uh, exactly. Like, like we'll be reading reading that. Also a collab with our girl Chronicles of Narnia. Oh. Okay. Fuck a thumb, yeah. which is live and well right now. Okay. Um, yes. Follow BPC on Instagram. It's going down. There has a little chart now. I think I saw it last night. Am I talking about the right thing or am I talking about Mel in the collective page? I hope I'm not mixing the two in Jerry. Help. So <laughs> I just hope I'm not. There we go. Journaling kit designer. Wow. It took me too long to get that. Also, I have lots of stickers. Okay. We probably don't need to go in there, but I have lots of stickers from a melon eclectic because why not i got some mermaid ones she has black mermaids y'all black mermaids okay wash well, there we go chronicles of narnia they're of narnia lord chronicles of noria definitely get on noria page noria gives like the most honest Reviews, but not review. swear words, and I love it. I love it. They're so word. animated. They make me laugh. Love She's like so animated. Yes. Okay. Clearly, all we're doing is gassing people up, and <laughs> it's pretty much is totally fine with me. Um, have y'all read Concrete Rose? I need more books like that. I, I haven't read it. My cousin is currently reading it and she likes it, but I haven't read it because I also haven't read The Hate You Give and I know it's like a prequel because it's the dad story. So I haven't read it yet. No, I haven't read it yet, unfortunately. I have not read it. I own it, but <laughs> I have not read it. I've just been trying to really be more intentional about Black authors who write nonfiction at this time. Hmm. So yeah. not saying that I won't read it. I'm just like trying to be on that nonfiction. So let's yeah. just put up um in Jerry stuff because it's like what we said, just in case y'all right. need to put down. Just in case you need to write all the plugs. Say this again, 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 again. Buy us for us, right? This is a Period. different type of FUBU. A different type of FUBU. Buy us for us. Literally. Y'all, I wish I had my stickers. It must be in my, it must be where my other um, stuff is at. Oh yeah, the Fuckathon merch is great and it's in collaboration with Melon in the Clay. If anybody in the chat wanna put in some links, I'm not opposed, I'm not opposed to that. I'm engaging in converse, so, or whatever it's called, conversation. So I can't do that right now. Any other questions that people have, I'm still talkable. What about y'all? I'm definitely still talkable. Still talkable. Is that a word? Who knows? We make words. Right. <laughs> what? It's the oh. neologisms for me. Yes. I do have a question for y'all. Do, do you ever feel some type of way when you put in work into your channels and it's not getting, it's not giving what it's supposed to have gave. Or do you think about that at all? Are you impervious to those thoughts? Did I call you out? <laughs> I, I, you got to answer. Me? Yeah, you got to answer. Well, here's the thing. 
Okay, you got to answer. I just, yes. So, I mean, and I feel some type of way is not the word because I have wonderful so I have subscribers who like who engage regularly in the content and who comment, and I'm so appreciative of them. What I find interesting about the booktube space is the bandwagon effect and the seasonal effect. Books come in seasons, and at that time, every video is about that book, which to me makes no sense. What, like, why are we? To me, that makes no sense um, because a lot of, like. You want to believe that you're different and that you're saying different things, but 15 videos are not different. That's just me. Moving on. So that's the that's the that's the seasonal. And the bandwagon and the bandwagon also of everyone reading the same book and everyone giving the review, everyone doing the same tag. And people say they want different things or they want to engage in conversations deeper. And but everyone be reading the same books. And so for me, when I do my like within the discourse series that's why because it's like apps like hood feminism is amazing read it read it read it it's not the like it's not the only book on feminism number one and you can talk about feminism without saying the word feminism right so i'm thinking about black intellectual history i'm right. thinking about I'm, I'm so for me like citationality so like the first video i did on within the discourse was about the word respectability and I was like, if I hear this word one more time incorrectly, she gonna scream. And also if I hear it without, without citation, because I, I hear people say respectability and, and they use it as an insult and that bothers me. Because one, no one is citing Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham who coined the term politics of respectability in like 1999, I think that's when that book come out, came out. It's called Righteous Discontent. I'll grab it in a second. I just don't want to screw it over. Um, but that like, and she's talking about the, the women's era, the progressive period, it depends on which historian you're, that, that's calling, talking about that term, but it's 1880 to 1920. So people call it progressive era, women's era, it just depends on the historian that's talking about the time period. But she's talking about the black women's, the black Baptist women's church movement, like, club women, all these different things. And she talks about policy, she talks about the politics of respectability as a tactic, right? It's it's a tactic. It was meant to evolve. And it it, it wasn't shucking and jiving. It wasn't doing white things in black face. And so when people talk about it as a way to denigrate older generations, as a way to say stop telling us to pull up our pants, you're just on that respectability politics, I'm like, listen. If you can't answer a follow-up question about it, then don't bring it up. Or just say I, it. Like, Twitter has ruined us for that. Y'all, like, people be popping off their mouth and 240 characters can't answer that a darn follow-up question. It's, it's just, so that, for me, that the, the reason I'm saying that is because when, if, if, when, those, when I do those sort of books on BookTube and everyone's talking about one book, and it's like, but what about this other book? that also has important interventions and y'all steady using the vocabulary of this book, but not engaging with the, the argument of this book or the author of this book, that bothers me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I just felt like you really came from my throat there because I read not in a bad way, a good way, you know? Okay. So I'm just like, I feel the same way when people open their human mouths and talk about intersectionality and forget about our girl Kimberly Crenshaw. Come on! I'd be like, that's is that what we're doing? We're forgetting about Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term, and and they make it seem like it's this new thing, and it goes back to what Britt you're saying of of how people just forget about the black woman. Yeah, like at all, like just no retribution. And I'm like, cool. Mm -hmm. oh, the kids want shiny new things that I'm like, but it's not new. Like that's not the, and that's why I call my series within the discourse. That's not how knowledge operates. Things don't just pop up that have never been seen before. There's a discourse that that person, that book, they're citing people because they're in conversation with those people. Yes, it's plagiarism. Like that is to avoid plagiarism, but also because that idea came from me reading this person's book and, and being involved in that conversation. So when we just like 
abstract things out of time, space, and discourse, I'm like, that's why the conversation is so shallow because you can't say anything else but that, but repeating that tweet that you that you got from that other person. But I also think it in a way, and this is me putting on my therapist hat, I think it also has to do with access, right? What okay. do people have access to? TikTok. That's it. No TikTok. YouTube. That's it. Instagram. We say we say YouTube, I mean not YouTube, we say Google is free, but who's actually Google is, Google is not an educator either. Like it's just it's pulling not, the tags. It's not, but people that's the term people love to yeah. say that Google is free, but no one's using it. It's also like we're in the book community, I feel like we're more we're more um as a whole, not as individuals. This is me making that assumption. I feel like as a whole we're more into reading about a monster who got hit by a vampire, some sucked out of the net. I think we're only here for the fantasy that we forget about the theories and how those things have come to be. And I'm, it's kind of like when I did that video about intersectionality and I talked about how to be anti-racist by Ibram X. Kennedy. And in that book, it was a chapter about um, gender and feminism. And then he coined, he talked about Makiki Kendall, but then he talked about, okay, Makiki Kendall said this, but he couldn't say that without also saying Makiki Kendall got this from Kimberly Crenshaw. You know what I mean? So it's like, where, know your source, like what you were saying, like, where is the citation? So I think people just hear flash words or like catchy words, like woke, Woke has been overdone, it's done, I don't want to ever hear it again. So it's like people hear stuff and they're just like, mm -hmm, yeah, but I'm wondering like, who has access to the stuff that we're talking about? We all have different education levels, right? Not everyone have access to that. So for me, I'm always saying like, how upset can I get at people without also contributing to elitism? You get what I'm saying? So absolutely, not it, but that's just what I think. Right, no, and that's that is absolutely true, and that's why I started doing within the discourse because I can't get mad at you for not citing this woman that I would have never heard of had I not been in graduate school, right? So it's like I wasn't citing her in college and high school. I wouldn't be citing her if I was my grown self not in this institution, right? So like that's that's why I really do the series because I can't get mad about hearing this word if no one is talking about where it came from. Um, and I, th I think a good, maybe, and maybe that's something to do because there are a lot of free lectures on YouTube. And so like thinking about, right, like Professor Tricia Rose had a lot of like really, a lot in this really accessible lectures or talks on structural racism and like the ways that structural racism comes in, in multiple sectors from housing to economics to education how all of those things are working in concert like i think that that would also just be a good thing to say because like yes google is free but i always say google is not an educator but youtube does have some really good free things that like if people like they couldn't access like not like, and access like they they might check it out, but then feel like they wouldn't be able to understand what the book is saying because it's in a larger discourse that they don't have access to. Videos on YouTube are like made to be talking to people who may not be expert in that field, but who want to talk about that particular topic. Right. I mean, to take it a step further, if WebMD is not an educator, why do you think Google is? Um, said, I can't, oh, Shay, come with it. We've been waiting. I'll meet you. <laughs> no, yeah, um, so for me, I think the uh, the thing about engagement that bothers me more than anything is when it's not Black people engaging, if I'm being quite honest. Um, when I'm having a conversation or the topic and it's really something that I want to discuss, and people who aren't black can be a part of the conversation, but there's things that the conversation, they won't be able to understand because they're not black. And so to see black people not engaging, I'm always like, I mean, I love 
you know, I have some of the most loyal uh, Caucasian subscribers out there that watch every live, even when they aren't live and go back and comment and everything. And I am super duper thankful for them. Like, love them, love them, love them. They're great people. But at the same time, it's like some like part of the reason I created this channel was for people that look like me. Right. It was to reach. Right. So like when like for me, Black Buck, Black Buck, most people that I've seen read it have been white. I can't discuss everything that happens in that book in depth with people that are not black because there are so many layers to that book that only a black person would be able to know and understand and accept and be able to have a conversation with about it. And so for me, sometimes that's what's discouraging because for me, it's like, but I, I rush to go watch, like when when the people, the black people in my subscription thing drop a video, I like rush to go watch it and like rush to get in the conversation. You know, like that's a thing that I try to like focus on doing. And so for me, it's just like, dang, and so a part of it is then, well, then do I need to put this labor and this work in for content for us if we're not watching it? Because if I wasn't, I definitely could. And this is, again, no, no shade to anybody. But I see how other Black creators can, can make many more videos when they're not having to talk about things that are as emotionally drained. When everybody in the book is white and you don't have to discuss that black people don't exist in this world or that they're not written correctly, like that's a different thing. If you're not having to discuss black people in predominantly white spaces, like a lot of the contemporary books that are coming out or now are dealing with uh, being in that because you're reading books about white people in spaces where everybody looks like them. You're not ever touching these books. There's a there's an emotional labor that you're not putting forth that those of us who are, are doing. And so it just like, it, it goes back and forth for me. It's like, well, so then should I put in this work? Should I just go and this is the book that everybody's reading? Should I read this and do this video? So I think that for me is more where it is because it's like, I'll get the engagement, but it's not the people that I'm trying to engage with, if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. So to piggyback on it, I like to, my dad used to always tell me, I have to do self-checks. And self-checks is when I step outside of myself and think of something from another person's perspective. So when I sit there and I said, okay, I'm going to do this video and this video is going to be um, about Black people. For example, when I did a review on how childhood trauma can affect Black children. Um, and I used The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison as, you know, template to guide and get into that discussion. I know personally that it was emotionally taxing. I even cried while filming, right? So when I put it out, same like you, Shay, when I was like, hey, I really want to get into discussion. I want to talk to people. And only white people came. Britt was in there. But, you know, mostly white people came. And I was just like, damn. But then I was like, okay, maybe this is a moment where I need to self-check. And I was like, if it was emotionally draining and a very vulnerable thing for me to do, maybe black people were like, sis, we know I ain't got time. You know, maybe it was putting, it was also emotion, emotional for them and draining for them. So I titter tat like you of being like, shit, do I put it out? But if they ain't got energy, why am I putting out energy? And it's like, it's just like this constant um, like state of should I or should I not? But then to take it a step further, I just realized when I'm doing something funny or saying something funny, people flock to my comments. But when I'm saying something like serious about like black people mental health or like trauma or just, you know, things that I'm really passionate about that don't, it's not really a theme in the book community to do the things that I talk about. So, and then I get like, no views or or nothing. So I'm I I often get a little bitter about. It. I have to be very honest about my condition as being a human being and, and experiencing bitterness and jealousy. So those things happen, you know. 
And I like even to piggyback on what you just said, like that was part of the reason why I haven't watched the Bluest Eye video yet. Because when it came out, I was already dealing with uh, death anniversaries in my family. And I was like, mm, I'm already emotional. I know Brie gonna hit some nerves. Like I know, and she gonna talk about some stuff and I ain't ready for it. But it's like, once this month passes, I'm gonna watch it and get in on it. Because again, when I saw it, I knew work went into it. I knew, and I had seen you talk about like how emotional you got. And so for me, it was like, I don't want this sacrifice to be in vain. So I'm making sure I'm gonna watch it. But also, like you said, I have to think about my mental health and where I'm at. And so that's part of the reason why for me, I try to, I try not to get into like super emotional topics so that I feel like other black people may still want to engage. And so when they still don't, it's like, well, dang, I didn't even get into the real stuff. Because for me, again, it's always mixed company. So when I want to talk about like super real stuff, like black trauma and childhood trauma, I'm always feeling like personally, like, see, the only reason I don't like talking about this in these type of spaces is because then I meet some of y'all that have watched a video like this. And then you go use this as your excuses for doing the anti-black things that you do. And then I don't like that. Like as like for me, I had this white couple that I called my adopted parent. And yes. at this point, we do not we no longer even speak, have not spoken in almost three years. Mm -hmm. And it was because a lot of it came from getting tired of y'all using the good in me to excuse why y'all treat people that look like me bad. Like, well, if everybody every if all black people worked as hard as you to get their degree, first of all. I shouldn't have had to work as hard as I did to get it to begin with. Let's start there. Exactly. Two, everybody ain't built like me. You aren't built like me. And you know you're not built like me. So why you would put it on another Black person to be built like me makes no sense. And so for me, like, it's also that thing as well, right? Is like understanding that like there are going to be things that we put into it and that we do. And I don't ever want to be that reason why people see these things and are like, well, I mean, we don't care about police brutality because y'all kill each other. Right. So it's like, like those conversations. And so that's why for me, it's always like, I'm always teetering on what can we talk about? Cause I want to reach my people. But at the same time, like, I know not only my people are going to see this. But that for right there, I rewarded for no. being non confrontational and disinterested. That part, right? I mean, even when filming that discussion, the bluest eye, I wanted to go deeper, but then I said, I don't have to. <laughs> like, no, this is a lot. Like, me doing this is a lot. Like, your girl had to nap. You get what I'm saying? I had to take a cup. Because I was just so much work that putting into that one video, which is why Britt was like, you were like, if you know, you know. I just had to say, I couldn't say anything more, Britt. It was literally, if you know, you know. And if you don't, listen, I'm still out here minding my black business. Still. Still. So it's like, whatever. And... And Jerry, if you don't keep saying these words, Pastor and Jerry, in, in the comments. Speak the truth. That Speak the means. truth. And, and you know, I think the thing about that for me and Jerry and Bree and Shay, I, to me, I have, I, when watching videos, to me, it comes back personality. So I think, and that's the way that minstrelsy gets communicated is through personality. Like people want to see black creators engage in the language of and what, and what they think of as the language. They want to hear us say lit. They want to hear child. They want to hear baby. They want to hear all of these words and things. And they want to see a certain type of energy. And it's like one Ain't nobody on 10 like that all the time. That's just not it. Two, I don't know you like that. That's why I always am careful to say, if you hit that big red button, thank you very much. We can be internet friends. I don't know you like that. You don't know me either. Like that there's that. If I feel like being there, then we gonna be there. But if not, then not. And then every topic does it is not 
vibing with that energy. When I'm talking about black privacy, that ain't it. When I'm talking about the black women's club movement and respectability as a tactic of survival, that ain't it. Like, that ain't it. Like when I when I when I release this video on Audrey Lord, that ain't gonna be it either. Let me let you know. So like, I just like the the minstrelsy comes in for me and what people expect of us. Like they want our personalities to be stereotypically sassy, and that that word to me is basic. To me, when I hear someone talk about black women being sassy, to me that word is basically a slur at this point because I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I know what you expect. Yeah, 100% agree. It's it's basically a slur. Don't say nothing to me about sassy black women. And that to me, that's I that's the that's that's language of minstrelsy. When I heard it, I almost right. heard the ER if you're being exactly. honest. Exactly. Like it's it's a language of, of minstrelsy. Don't do it. I don't like it. Because it's low key, you're trying to act like my anger or in this situation and the way I feel is not warranted by by using that word sassy and like the things that you let slide when you're younger because you don't realize the connotation that as you get older you're like why do y'all keep using this one word why is this word so like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that that word don't really fit me but like life 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 getting called sassy 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 and not getting that connotation until I'm like 25 and I'm like that made my skin crawl. Yes. It's like, back to choosing violence. If you call me <laughs> sassy, you want these hands. I'm talking about the one, two, three combo. If you tell me I sound white, you want these hands. What you telling me is choose violence. Do I, I have know to get some French for you to get it? Come on, get French. I Come know we're going to talk about these words one day because I know we've already like stuff brought it up. But, bruh, every time I see a non-Black person talk about somebody catching hands, and I'd be like, do you fight, though? Like, do you really know what it means to throw these hands and elbows? Because, like, I promise I'm not above giving you a one-on-one tutorial because, like, I feel like you're using these things and you don't understand what you're actually saying. Because, literally, that's a choosing violence legitimately. Right. Right. Like if you don't realize that that's what you're saying, you probably shouldn't say it. And also, like it's different for you to be to even choose violence. Like for you as a white person to say you're gonna get these hands, it's a joke. It's funny, ha ha. Let Shay say you're gonna get these hands. Her, she would be deplatformed. Right. We would all be deplatformed. I I barely have one. We and I. (laughs) <laughs> Break up to Waymo from YouTube. So here's the thing. You're in breach of our family friendly, blah, 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 code of conduct, blah, 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 community, right. blah, blah, blah. It would be instantaneous. Right. Also, because you know that I know what it means. So you know if it comes out of my mouth, you definitely think that okay. I am violent. You don't think I'm sense. joking. You don't think I'm being <laughs> funny. You think, oh, did she say on site? I thought that might have been what she said. Sure, she probably means this. I did. You know, because on-site means what? Let's go. Amen. A- ain't no talking. We ain't got to be articulate. We ain't got to be very eloquent. None of that. I love what we just did there. Because that's what it means. Hold on. I'm trying to get to the, the chat. The chat is blowing up. and We chatting away. Um, 100% calling a black woman sassy would never be rude. Never not be rude. No Period. other black woman has ever called. Speak your truth. That part. I have never called a Deserves a slow clap. We don't say that to each other because we know the history of the word. How we go, it's ironic in the extreme for us to be on book two and to be using words like mini grenades and act like it's flowers. It's Sassy just- is not a compliment. How you don't know that? How you doing all this reading and still not translating to knowledge or wisdom? There's just certain things, and and I'm like stepping a little bit away from the, the book conversation. There's certain phrases and things that a white person can tell me that just don't sit right in my spirit. Like mm-hmm. if a white person tells me I know how to dance or want to get dance, want to dance with me, I'm thinking you're ready for me to chuck and jive. It's just right. the way that it comes out. 
don't always hit versus if a, a black person or specifically a black woman will say it to me. So right. sassy and because that's what I've been told like my whole life, like white women just really want to dance with me. When I was younger, I would I would even accept white women slapping me on the butt, which now as a fully recognized black woman adult, I'm like, what the, you know what I mean? So to me, it's just, it's giving me very much slavery. You want me to give you entertainment. And that's just not where it's at. So it's just a lot of phrases out there and just connotations that just don't sit well with me. I, when I first started and people would like find my channel because I got shouted out there would be so many she talks just like cardi b in what world wait people said what? that to you yeah they're like she sounds just like cardi b she sounds like i'd be like now i've been following cardi b long before love and hip-hop because i just thought she was outlandishly like out there and i was like this girl, somebody gonna make her famous i just know it because she just be saying whatever comes out her mouth and mm -hmm. don't be caring so I was like, now I know me and I know that I don't, but the fact that it just kept being like a repeated thing. And I just, huh. You know, some things just don't make sense in the math don't math. People swear I look like the girl from True Blood. What? The math ain't mathing. And that's where we're at. Right. That part. Amen. I mean, I like what Shy said about even when people say you have so much attitude in a positive way, it never feels never, never, never. And I link that up to what and Jerry said after that: authentic black joy and excitement perceived as minstrelsy. Right. But if I want to be happy and my happiness comes out, however comes out, that's fine. It's when you begin expect, expecting it all the time, number one, or expecting it to come out in, in ways that you perceive as sassy or attitude. No, because the thing is, like, to what Shay said, it comes out as, like, extra. Like, that's the implication of sassy and attitude, no, is that it's extra when in, in, in actuality, it's very much merited. It came in the can. I ain't had to add nothing to it. Like, this is just what the situation calls for. It was in the recipe. What you mean? I had to add nothing to this. This is just what's real. And so it undermines, it undermines what we say when, when the word sassy or attitude gets added to it because it has the connotation of extraness. And it has the connotation of something that, that according to propriety would not have been said, but because you're so sassy, because you so attitudinal, you be crossing those boundaries of propriety per usual. And congratulations for crossing boundaries. And it's like, okay, but like being transgressive gets punished. And I have to be very aware of that. Right. And right. now you're acting like my, my regular in the recipe speech is transgressive when I'm just responding to my life. So then my life is extra. Now we're back to anti-blackness. Do you see how we always? Okay. And Case in point, the only black lady on Real Housewives of, uh, what is it? I want to say Real Housewives in New York um, and how they called her angry because the conversation was there are, there are other white ladies yelling, drunk, belligerent, angry. One white lady says something about them yelling and says something along the lines of, well, maybe it's about how educated you guys are. Maybe it's a lack of education. Uh, and the black woman says, well, I don't know how real that is because I'm the most educated person at this table, which by definition, degree wise, she was the most educated person at the table. The white woman took that as her calling her uneducated and disrespectful and says, why are you so angry? Now, mind you, you haven't asked any other person, not the people yelling, not the people getting ready to throw drinks and cursing, but the black woman who's sitting directly next to you talking to you like I'm speaking right now is angry. But it goes back to black people oftentimes in the white gaze 
aren't allowed to have emotions in range of emotions and be their authentic goddamn selves. Because the moment that we show any emotion that's other than submissiveness or nice or just cheery all the time, yes, then we are deemed something that's inhuman mm-hmm. or something that shouldn't be able to express ourselves. It's Automatically like, excessive. It's just like white people, you did not event anger. You did not <laughs> Sadness, well, exactly, and you don't get to regulate who feels it. You, you don't, don't get, get to regulate again. Like, like that, like that's, that's the issue to for me. Minding our black business, right? Like that, that white lady in Victoria's Secret who threw herself on the floor and said she was having a mental breakdown. Like, no, you don't get to use your white tears and your obvious mental distress to weaponize yourself against me. And then to watch all of those people tell that black lady, you should stop. Not this woman yelling, not this woman screaming. We have seen black people not even do that and lose their lives. Let alone like black people actually have a valid mental health disorder and have a valid mental health break. I haven't forgot the black therapist who was dealing with a person having a mental break who got shot trying to help somebody and he wasn't even the person having the break. Like these are things that like, for me, it's just like, y'all don't seem to understand that these are the things that make people break down even more. Right. These are the things that cause people to have these mental breakdowns. Right. Like the summer that Philando Castile and Alton Sterling died was the worst summer by far for me. So by the time 2020 came around and everybody was up in arms, I was like, y'all didn't, y'all, Y'all don't No. It's the first time. This is the first time. This can be the first this time. This can be the first time. As if that was the as if Alton and Sterling were the first time. Exactly. Alton, I'm like Philando has to the first time anyway. Trayvon. They were still four years before Trayvon. So like, actually, we like, have did we not know about Emmett Till? Or any of the black boys who didn't get on Ebony or Jet magazine. Like Right. This thing is a reality, like black death. Here's the theory I'm sprinkling in Brie. Black death exists in constant black life. I'm sorry. Black life exists in constant relation to death. That is what Christina Sharp says in her book in, in her book in the wake on blackness and being constant. And the wake is the wake of slavery. Yes. We are existing in the wake of slavery. And she's and she's she's in conversation with Sadia Hartman, who's her basically like a mentor to her and, and, and riffing off of her time, the afterlife of slavery, which is heightened chances of violent death prematurely and constrained circumstances in life. This is the afterlife of slavery. These are the legacies of slavery. Black people are living in the wake of catastrophe every day. And that has structural and private implications. Like it's a macro and micro thing every day. I was just gonna say. This is why I always tell people that trauma is passed on generation to generation. There we go. The trauma, grandma experience, baby, it's up in you. Absolutely, it's it's there. I was gonna say a lot of the things that people like in dealing with that. Most people don't realize that's where a lot of things come from. Like a lot of black people as children were raised not to turn that light on in the car because if you do you're gonna get a ticket your mom's gonna get pulled over it didn't come from that because that's solely what happened it came from black people having cars in the south and being pulled over for no reason and losing their lives like these things have real things that happened that created them and they may not exist in the exact same nature today but that doesn't mean that the reason for them wasn't valid in how they came up back with respectability politics and what that was like it has a lot more to do with protecting yourself than it ever had to do with pleasing white people like that's why we get these stupid phrases like i am not my ancestors i definitely am not my ancestors you know why because they did what i know i couldn't i know i couldn't have lived through that i know i'm not strong enough for that i know that 
I'm not going to ever disrespect them and think that what they did took weakness because I remember watching the NK Jemison class and her talk about Octavia Butler having to bite that pill and put white people on her cover. So her story was out there. If she didn't bite that pill, we wouldn't have an NK Jemison. And I can't forget that. Right. Or even. Go ahead, Bree. Oh, no, go ahead. To, and to even, especially because there's this wonderful story of Octavia Butler. I love the fact, I'm not on it because I don't have the capacity right now, but I love that it's happening in the universe. Um, but I think the benefit of a slow read is going to take more time with it. And I, I'm, I'm teaching a class on Black women science fiction and fantasy right now. And I'm telling my students, because we're reading Kindred, you're not, you, when you read a book, you need to be engaging the author. Right, like part of the responsibility of the reader is research. You need to know who this author is. What number book is this for them? Like how important is this author to the genre? When you're reading Kindred, you need to know that it's her fourth book and like why we call her the mother of, of black sci-fi and listen to some interviews that she did. And she talks about, like Kindred is an amazing book. She talks about that very thing cache in Kindred, not about, about, about putting like, people on her cover, but she talks about, um, and she comes up in multiple interviews because it really resonated with her. She was on a college campus and she was listening to, uh, she, there was a, a friend, a colleague, whomever, her age who was saying, I could never be a revolutionary because if I was going to be a revolutionary, I would have to start the revolution by killing my own parents. That's what he said. Because to him, he was saying because they they struck it and jiving like everybody else, but and that's and that is why that was part of the the impetus for her to write Kendra because she was like, you don't understand what what people had to do for us to be able to survive, and which is why she sent Dana back. You like you have to you don't understand because you haven't experienced it. You're experiencing something as a black person now, absolutely. But to say that what your ancestors did was shucking and jiving, that's the only reason you're here. That th Those tactics, which is why I don't like when people are denigrating respectability, it's a tactic. Those tactics of survival had nothing to do with idolizing whiteness. They wanted their kids to survive, and here you are. Here and here you are. And so I think like reading those books slower helps us to have those conversations about with the author's project and writing books like Kindred to really make people wrestle with with, with slave legacies and really really going back and wrestling with slave legacies and also and I don't know if that's if that if that's what happened in the conversation on Kindred, but putting that in conversation with other black women's narratives of slavery, like um and Citizen in Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Ann Jacobs, which was the first um, published slave narrative by a black woman. Because the, the slave narrative is masculinist, like it's, it's mostly men. And Harriet Jacobs was the first. And she has this line where she basically says only by experience um, and saying like only by experience. Are you going to be able to understand the things that I'm saying? Because there was a lot of um, conflicts for Jacobs about whether or not what she was saying was treats people like it's too awful. And so then when you move up, and that was in 1861, and then you move up to 1976 or 79, and you see Octavia Butler moving in that principle of only by experience, sending Dana back in the bicentennial of this country's founding and saying, you're going to have to wrestle with the complicated nature of your legacy in this country as a Black woman married to a white man in 1976 and then also in, in in the 19th century like that those books are helping us to, to talk about things that we're still dealing with now tangent over but that just really when you said oh, that, that really took us to the classroom and i don't know about anybody in the chat but i was like taking notes okay harriet jacobs i was like all right cool cool writing them all down i also want to say like and this is kind of like the side note but not really I've been into reading a lot of um, black classics and the way that our ancestors talk about the black experience intersectionally without even saying it, it's fucking transformative and magical and teary a bit and very, very. It definitely has changed my viewpoint on like, 
it's all, I've always felt like the classics didn't align with me. Like I always thought that they didn't fit. And so like, I've always preferred black classics, but since I've like found the list that you have and whatnot, and I've started reading them even more. So it's been like, a, this is what we should be reading. Like, how much different, how much more pride, how much more everything would we have as a people if these were the stories we read from childhood on, right? If these we were reading in high school versus Shakespeare's, I, I guess, but like outside of like, what does that have to do with any, like, right? They don't have anything to do with life now, right? With how we move through the world now, right? Right. First of all, y'all don't even want to respect the fact that black people make up words. Y'all want to disrespect that like Shakespeare didn't give us so many daggum words. Exactly. You respect it when it comes from this supposed white man. But you cannot ever, <laughs> you cannot ever accept these when it comes from us. And so like the more that I'm getting into these black classics, the more I'm like, what would it mean for our people if things shifted? Like, right. why is it that you guys keep these things hidden? Why is it that these aren't things that you guys encourage us to read? Right. right. Because it will probably change how we look at you. Exactly. It'll probably change how we move. Exactly. Right? Because, like, even in talking about respectability, you can act and engage in respectability while still calling out the practice that I have to act this way for you to treat me as human. you. Don't. Like, I don't understand why we can't accept that to be a thing. Right? Like, I can still talk to an officer with respect while still acknowledging that I shouldn't have to talk to you like that for you to respect me, but I'm going to because I know that that's what a human being does. You are still another person. I'm not going to disrespect you just because of your job, and you shouldn't disrespect me just because of the color of my skin. Like, that's what engaging in respectability is more so about than it is for all these other things. And I feel like that I feel like that's part of the reason why the conversations get lost so much is because like you like you guys are saying, we don't talk about where they come from and then we don't talk about what they look like when you're doing them right. 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 It's right. not sitting there and saying if black people don't act like this, you don't need to listen to their voice. That's not at all what it's saying. Yeah, it's not at all what it is. It's saying that I know in order to keep myself safe, I have to do this. You know what it is because you code switch. So acting like you don't understand makes no sense. Right, right. Code switching, I think we should have a whole nother Man, discussion about to code switching right. in mixed company CC book, booktube. <laughs> really right. to be the tagline. Write it down. Somebody record right. no skin. But I said even in this we're talking this way and we're all still code switching we're still code we're switching, still code switching. We're, and we're very real but we're all still code switching still code switching i want to go back just go back to brit sermon she gave us about the assignment for the class engage in the author right now that i've been being i you did i don't remember what I think it was a couple actually videos Brit, that I've watched of yours and you were talking about that. And cause for a while I would just read, read, and read, not know nothing about the author. And then I felt like you, you were calling me out being like, sis, that's not it. So I said, okay, I'm going to engage more. And now that I've been engaging, it's like this web of connections that my mind is not open to. And I say that one of my favorite books of all time that was released this year was The Lesson by Malcolm Cadwell. If I didn't see the similarities to Octavia E. Butler Kindred in there, I don't know what it is. So I say all that to say, it's like you engage with the authors, then you start seeing their influence and how it still exists today. So. The books that I've been reading lately, I can see that influence. I see it in Nettie Okorafor. Like you can see the legacy of Octavia E. Butler still thriving today. And I say all that to say is engage with the authors. Um, it's, a whole, it's a whole conversation we're missing when we don't know what their project was. Like, why did you write Kindred? Right, like that. It's a whole, 
it's a whole conversation and a whole set of nuances we're missing when we don't take into account why they wrote this character this way. Because writing is a craft, right? And yeah. we don't have to be on author tube to appreciate that. We understand nope. as readers that writing is a craft. And it doesn't have to be more than for us to, to think that every single word was chosen with, with intent. Every writer chooses words with intent because if you chose to say it this way, you didn't you didn't say it that way. So if we're taking the writer seriously and considering them as one who wrote this for an audience and for a purpose, then we have to engage in what has been the arc of their of their literature and what are they saying in interviews? What do they want us to get out of that? And I find that good to do for these contemporary writers that I'm reading. I, I, yeah. We we were gosh, Jay, I wanna know what that face was. But we 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 also read Dread Nation in this class that I'm teaching. And um Justina Ireland did an interview um where she was talking about she had and she she'd been um on a, a school visit. Hmm? This is the author of Dread Nation. Yes. Go on. Okay. Yes. Yes, Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. Sure. So she she was talking about a school visit and she was talking about writing these books. This is why it's interesting to know what, what number book this is. Dread Nation is her third or fourth book. The first book where there's a black girl on the cover. Here's why that's important. So in her interview, she was saying, you know, I'm talking, I'm doing my thing, whatever. And this black girl raises her hand and says, it's great that you wrote a book and everything. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I want to see books with girls who look like me. And she said she was so embarrassed to, to have received that because she was like, I went home and I had to, I had to wrestle with myself that like, I, I did not have a, a story about a black girl or one on the cover at that point. And that's when she wrote Dread Nation. And we see looking even at the, the paratext or at the, the cover of, of Dread Nation, Jane is right on the front, right? And the dedication of, of Dread Nation is to my colored girls, I see you with a heart. Now, I don't know why she chose colored girls because that word is also anachronistic or out of time. And so basically a slur. But if I believe the best of this writer, I want to believe that she's giving a shout out to Intizaki Shange's 1976, I think, choreo poem for color girls who considered suicide when the uh, when the rainbow was enough. That's, I want to believe. Read it if you haven't read it before, people in the chat. Definitely read it. Yes, it's amazing. I want to believe that she was calling out to that was with using that word. I really do. Um, but so, but so that makes sense then when we see Jane being who she is, when we see the cover, when we see the dedication, all those things make sense because we know now that her project is to put a black girl front and center. And she talks about that a little bit in her author's note of wanting to put black people um, back into history in places where we don't usually see them, like the old West. So that like that's just another another example of like it's really helpful to engage with writers and see what their project is because that's so i had read dread nation before without that interview and i was like oh this everything is making more sense now right i did a little research on zora um, neil herson and in doing my research i found okay she was an anthropologist i have an anthropology degree so while reading barracoon like everything made sense to me like just look at reading it through like an anthropological lens made sense to me, but it also angered me and made me be honest about my critique of the book. And like, you know, I get it. You wanted to know this valuable information from Koju. Like I, I get that Kojo, sorry, or Kojo, or I'm saying the name wrong, but from um, the, the man she was interviewing, but that violence and reliving that violence that she was exposing him to, I would argue if it was worth it. Like the man was literally torn apart and was saying like, this is hard, or, you know, I need you to go, or I can't talk about this. And that is the line that a lot of anthropologists get, get criticized about. It's like, how much pain are you willing to put your subject through to get the story? to understand it. So reading Barracoon and thinking about who she was, an anthropologist, and thinking about it from, you know, that lens really made sense to me while I was reading. 
And we just keep saying the same stuff of knowing the author. I think that's what we just keep saying. <laughs> yeah. I think also with the newer authors, especially, I think that it's important because I think it 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 explains so much by why they write the content that they write. And so I feel like a lot of times just getting to know and engage that author helps you to make better decisions about what you choose to read and what you choose to engage with because you know what this person's content is and where they're coming from in their story wise. Um, Cause I feel like sometimes people expect things from authors and it's like, but why have you not seen what they do? This they're never going to give you that because that's not them. Right. So stop asking for people to give you something they're not going to give you because one that creates these stupid reviews. Of, well, I thought I was getting this. Well, you did it. You wanted to get this and you didn't get that. And now you're mad. And that that I feel like that hinders, you know, black authors so much because people expect these things. And it's like, no, the book was pretty like specific about what you were going to get. Um, specifically the thing that pops to me is Lizelle. Like there's been so there, there were comments about there's not a lot of magic from the book of the book. You learn that she does not have magic. She is working to get magic. So why you thought there was going to be a lot of magic in the book don't really make sense. So you're complaining and you're giving it a two star review because it wasn't as much magic in it as you had hoped. But she told you that before you opened the book. But you know what else that is? People like, and that's when these hashtags and these and these movements. Thank you, and Jerry. That means so much coming from you. I really respect you as a thinker. Um, that just means so much. Thank you. That made my night. Um, but I I think that that also comes. These hashtags get the freak out of control when this comes to hashtag Black Girl Magic, hashtag Black Joy, and like. It gets out of control and it creates an expectation for what that magic and that joy looks like and who that magic and that joy is accessible to, which goes back to black privacy to, for me. Right. Like for me and that and, and, and thinking of that, I'm thinking about Kevin Quashie's book, The Sovereignty of Quiet, um, talking about black interiority. <laughs> like when black people have an interior and we need it. Like it, it would not be here without it. Like it's protecting psychic, it's protecting psychic space, right? And so, like when and and the and the the historian that that said that is gave me. I'll put it in the chat when I remember it. But it's creating psychic space that interiority is needed. And she was talking about it with um, rape in the middle lives of black women. I want to say it's Deborah Gray White, but that name doesn't sound right on my tongue to me. So I'll put it in the chat. But she was talking about creating psychic space. Um, between to 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 allow black women to have a self that we present that that we ain't gotta have smoke with you about, and then a self that is for us and ours, and you don't have access or a right to that self that's for us and ours. You don't have any right to it. And sometimes white people, you fall on the outside of a lot of things, and that's okay. Like you fall on the outside of really seeing black girl magic in some situations because we don't want you to see all of our magic. It ain't for you. If it had been for you up till now, it would have been stripped. That's how colonization we works. We can't keep showing you. Commercialized. We can't keep showing you these things. They get stolen. And so like when people are talking about Lizelle's book and talking about there wasn't magic, there was magic. And for me, which I said in my review, what was what was enthralling to me was the family. That we saw cousins and aunts and uncles and grannies and mom and dad and stepmom and, and sister who, who we love so much. Like we saw a huge black family in relation and, and weathering the storm and it was beautiful. The, the commitment to staying together was beautiful. Like Voya didn't have magic, but she was surrounded and protected by her family's magic, right? And so, like for me, you're saying there was a magic, and I'm like, you weren't reading the book. It was there was magic everywhere, or but, you, magic but it wasn't could available look way, to you, right? Magic could look right. you're looking for fantastical, pew pew exactly. situations. Because every exactly. chapter the cousin was mind reading, so something magical was happening every chapter, right? So, like, Come on. I'm like, you didn't see her in the cousin you're indicating right here. Don't you're seeing people who are dead. That's a form of magic. You're like, ha like there's so many different things, and it's just like 
just say you bought the book because it was a black girl and it was in fantasy and you were like, okay, I'm going to mark this off. And it just wasn't what you right. wanted it to be. Like, just right. Just say that. Because as someone who, like Britt knows, I am breaking into one YA and specifically YA fantasy as a reader. Because again, like for me, it's like, like I like being transported to another world. But I've hated reading these books where black people get transported to a world where like all of a sudden them being black don't matter no more. And it's like, but that's not real life. And even if it was a real thing, you don't just forget everything you experienced for the last X amount of years because you're in this new place. That's not how life works. And I feel like. I feel like because people use the excuse that books are meant to be an escape they use that as an excuse to not deal with what's really happening in real life. Like we don't want books that address this. We don't want books that handle this. Cause we just want to, I don't want to deal with the real world. And it's like, but I mean, a book only lasts a few pages, bro. Like, I mean, you still live in the real world. Like it's right. still there. It's still there. And I completely agree with what Adrian is saying is like, these books are serious. Most of these people, y'all know that before y'all start going off and making y'all conversations about, and y'all still do that. I like how we are standing firmly in our frustration and none of us have apologized for it. I like that. I just wanted to say that. Because I've spent most of my life apologizing for me feeling a fucking emotion. So, which book is that I just jumped in? Blood Like Magic by Lizelle Sanberry um, is book one. Um, there is a book two coming out next year. She's actually, shout out to her, she's actually contracted for four books. And this is her first one. So she already has a horror that's set to come out in 2023. And then another one that she's contracted with. So she's she's definitely killing it. She also she's has an author tube. Yeah, so. an author tube channel. Yes, yes, yes. But for them as well, strong black family unit doesn't exist. And therefore they don't see the magic in those family Ooh, units. Say that, Erica. If that ain't a word. Say that. And I will I will I wanna lightly direct you to the color of law. Uh, hey. just wanna lightly direct you to the color of law if you need any more context to that. And I might even stir you to the new Jim Crow. All right. Rape in the inner lives of black women in the Middle West by Deborah Clark. Hines is a historian who talks about psychic space for black women. And that's when you were saying like a black, like a, a space where you're to the world and a space when you're to yourself, right? Right, right. She, she coined this term called cultural dissemblance and that's the psychic space. This cultural dissemblance where you present oneself, one public self that people assume is like who you are. Um, and by you, we mean a public, and by a public, we mean white. And so you present a public self, and really a political self, because she's also, she's in the same time period as um, as Evelyn Burke Higginbotham. She's, and she's still in the 1880s and 1920. That's the Black Women's Club movement. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a lot of Black Women's Club movements pop up with churches and, and sororities, right? So like, she's saying like, we're, we're presenting a public self a political stuff because we're fighting for black women's rights we're fighting for black communities rights we're talking about voting we're talking about women's bodies we're talking about being able to exist, to exist outside the home um but and so to do that we don't want you to have access to what we do with our families right we don't want you to have access to like our our personal lives and so we dissemble so we present this public political self that seems to be who we are and all we are that's all you have access to and then we have a private self so it's a culture of dissemblance. It's very much um, akin to the politics of respectability where it's a public self for political purposes, for strategy, for tactic. You're muted. 
Bree, you're muted. Bree, can you hear us? Because you're muted. Well, speaking to myself is wonderful. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> I was saying, well, we have passed the grip, giving us what we deserve, is what I was saying. <laughs> and I said, the next one is the utopia of colorlessness. That is what they are projecting. And questions we are still asking for in the comment section. Great. This book is so great. Without braces. Hold up. Get the pen it's, ready. This is so good. Racism without races by Edward uh, Bonilla Silva. Um, or Eduardo. But it's this book is so accessible. Like when you read it, like the language is so clear. He gives examples. Like it really talks about. So, and this is like, this is the fifth edition. So, this book has been out. Um, I think I'm saying so since 1990. Don't let me lie to you. Not about my birth year. Is it? I don't. Let me see. Let me not lie. Hey, shout out no. 90, baby. What? I yes. lied. I'm sorry. It was. It's been out since 2003. And this. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's been <laughs> it's been out since 2003, the first edition. But this is the fifth edition. I'm so sorry. You. Oh man. Oh no! <laughs> I was just kidding. I was like, I'm out of here. I, to <laughs> I saw you starting the second last celebration. I was like, oh, I don't want to, but it's not true. <laughs> the first edition came out in 2003, and the fifth edition, which is the one I have, came out in 2018. But it's called Racism Without Races: Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequity in America. This book is so good for getting at the time that, that we're in. People don't want to talk about racism, but continuing, but continuing interpersonal racism, continuing structural racism, right? Like into all of the things, systemic racism, like they want to do all of the racism, but they want to talk about, well, affirmative action. They want to talk about, well, I'm being discriminated against, reverse racism, all the things. That's another choose violence situation for me. Like, that's just, the, please don't come at me with things that don't make sense and are not possible structurally. It is not structurally possible. And systemically. Right. Or like, Th that just don't go. I don't have privilege. That. I'm a white person that grew up poor. Oh, okay. So then you can read white, for, you can read white priority. Let me find that and put that in the chat for you. Um, because, so there but was an idea. Hmm. No, I'm not to say this, but I think what the thing is, going back to what we talked about, the negative effects of buzzwords, right? Everywhere, yes. everyone's like, privilege, 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 with forgetting that there are different types of privileges. So, yes, you may not have a social economic privilege, but you still are white. You still exist in this world as white. No one's going to walk up to you and be like, hey, I got to beat you up because you're black. Or, you know, you don't have to worry about those things. So if you are white and you are poor, being white is not an issue. And, I mean, I don't know. No, it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> and it's stuff, it's stuff like, like I, I, I think in my head. In real life, nobody wants to be actually colorblind. So why do y'all think this fake colorblindness makes any sense? Like in real life, colorblindness is a deficit. It keeps you from being able to see things as they are, which can be dangerous to you. So why do we think that being colorblind towards people would not have the same effect? It's just, it's just right. a question for me then. Questions that need answers, and and white priority is a is an essay by Shannon Sullivan, and essentially she was giving a talk about, um, she was giving a talk about white privilege, and a white woman in the community came up to came up to her and was like, 
And by the way, I believe Shannon Sullivan is white. So this woman came up to exactly Erica. So this this woman came up there and is like, I'm white. I live in a trailer. I'm on welfare. Like I don't have any privilege. And so Shannon Sullivan's like, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. So she goes and she, and she thinks and comes back with, with white priority. And essentially it's the knee. <laughs> Jenna said, pow. um, it's the, it's the need to feel like you're coming before black people as a white person, right? So like white priority, you want to feel like you're coming before black people. So in essence, it's having a, it's having a racial glass floor. You can be broke as broke as broke. You can be on welfare, food stamps, all, all the things, but at least you're not black. That's why priority. First of all, can we just say that the fact that you are white and that you live in a trailer and you are on welfare is not necessarily an assumption would automatically be made about you simply because you're white. I'm not going to keep throwing this book at this camera. You know how black folks, when they hear stuff and they just yes. start throwing anything nearby. Let's just play a little game with the three of us. Raise your hand if someone has asked you if you have children. This Raise man your really hand. came up to me and said, you look grown like you got kids. And stuff. I used to get, I said, not, not do you got kids, how many kids you got? Oh dang! Wait, someone did ask me that. Dang it! Right, right. I know. Mean, I was like, you gonna raise your you hand? You kind of act like ain't nobody asked you, but somebody asked. You know, I don't have a good memory. I just be like, I leave me alone. Know. I rebuke you. But it happens. Who's looking at us, being like, you know, that uterus has been active. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Who's okay. minding their business? Stop me asking without kids. How many times have you been with a child and somebody assumed that child was yours? Or see, has that happened to you? Man, I don't, see, I don't bear around well, children like that in the public. Since I was like seven. But I was a very tall, big seven, so people thought I was like... I ain't never been big tall seven. a day in my life and they didn't ask me since I was 14 years old. I ain't yeah. never been tall a day in my life. You ain't so never looked at me and been like, she's super grown, never. Never, never, never. Well, you're black, so you're super grown automatically. Like that's the adultification of black children and black yeah. women. You are yes. a woman. Disallowed yeah. childhood, disallowed fragility. Because that's I the mean, thing. It's like we can talk about white fragility and that being that being basically a, a, a social handicap, and it is. But but also like people need to be able to break, and that's not allowed for black women. Like that, it's not so. Essentially, Erica, it's if you, if a white person is saying you're discriminating against me. Ooh, I'm gonna just back up from the camera real quick because that comment. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, we can say the same thing for uh, Talia Hibbert. I won't go there if we don't want to, though. Mm, mm, mm. I am mm. both. We're gonna go there. I'm gonna I say it. No, 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 it wasn't us. It was literary was lady. We in. Lies. I'm just I'm gonna 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 lies, garbage, and trash. I knew you, Britt, was going to be like, you know what? Let's talk about Legendborn. Because I know how you think about Legendborn. What? I, literally, I was like, what? This is what, that is who I was thinking about. Britt, you know me. That is who I was thinking about when I was like, why do both the love and just have to be white? And why are you just, I literally in my notes, where are my notes? Now you've gotten me started. But, but I, not only white had to make one of them seem like racially ambiguous a little bit. That's how I read it. No? Was so racially ambiguous? It, it gave me a little bit no, of. No, no, no. Brie, let me read you the description because I had to write it down and I was like, she's not serious right now. Here's the description of Selwyn Kane. And then here's the description of Nick. I had to write it down. I liked Legendborn still, though. Hmm? I did. I liked Legendborn. That's fine. I think the writing is wonderful. The world building is tight. But I do have this major this major issue with it. So the way she describes Sel is he's unsettlingly beautiful. His face is aristocratic and sharp framed by high, pale cheekbones. The rest of his body is born from shadows, 
black jacket, black pants, and ink black hair that falls over his forehead and curls just below gauged ears, bearing small black rubber plugs. He can't be more than 18, but something about his features doesn't belong to a teenager. The cut of his jaw, the line of his nose, his stillness. So now here's the thing. Black everything else but black is what, is what you're saying. I, I like everything that's not like right. So his his whiteness is startling and, that is and apparent true. in that moment. Yeah. And Nick is the same way. Like she describes him as the exact opposite of the bane of book lovers. He she describes Nick as the exact opposite, essentially. Um, leaning against the wall just beside the exit is a tall white boy with tousled straw blonde hair and the bluest eyes I've ever seen. He looks like he belongs on the cover of the university brochure and possibly bright and cheery wearing plain jeans and a Carolina blue zipped hoodie. When he laughs, the sound is warm and genuine. So Nick is the exact opposite of Cell, but he's still completely beautiful in his whiteness and his genuine warmness. And I'm just like, that bothers me, Miss Tracy Dion. It just bothers me. Dion. It, it bothers, it bothers me the, to see like them portrayed in that way. And I'm I'm sorry. Cause I know others have forgiven him. We're not I, apologizing today. Have, hmm? We're not apologizing today. Oh, okay, I take it back. Cause I me and Cell are gonna have forever beef. And when he threatened Brian that I will rip your tongue out of your head because she actually had the courage to speak back to him, I said, We're never gonna be cool, Cell. We're never gonna be cool. I don't care if Brie likes you, I will never like you. Never. I don't care what you thought you were doing, I'll never like you. I'll never. I mean. Let's be real. Back to what Salter was saying, like you can appreciate the work and still critique patterns. Exactly. I, I definitely agree with that. And I, I said a little bit of my critique for Zora Neale Hurston. And mm -hmm. even though I really love um, Legendborn, you know, a big critique, me reading, I'm like, damn, they're, her best friend couldn't even be black? Literally. And she's literally the worst friend? Best friend ever. The worst, worst friend. Like mentioned from the start of the book, I said, "Where did they do this?" That right, and I'm just like, the only black people is the one who work in the kitchen in the back. <laughs> the one black psychiatrist. Right, and I'm like, this this will be writing in 2021 and Mama with unresolved trauma. So it was just I, a lot. It was a lot, but I liked it. But I still was like, hmm. But I, I mean, like I'm teaching it in this class as well, right? So, like, I, I, it's valuable. I, I think the way it brings in slave legacies, it's valuable. But the way it deals with, the way it's contributing to this trend of only white love interest, it's troubling. It is. It is. Hey, literary lady. I would say y'all already better than me because Brit knows. Like, I don't read interesting no like at all. Like. And if I find out that it's interracial romance and I want to read it, I will not read it because I just will not contribute to it. That's just yeah. a me personal thing. Like, I won't watch it. I won't read Like, eh. It you got to, like, it sneak it in. I got to be, like, five episodes in and figure it out. Like, the other black girl. So, I like the other black girl, the book. I like the, black, the book, the other black girl. But yeah, yeah, everything about the book had I known before, I would have never picked it up because it deals with every type of black situation that I don't like to engage in reading in or I don't mm -hmm. like to be like, I don't like to support. And yeah. it's because run, I don't like narratives where we put black people against black people in predominantly white situations. Yes. I don't like that. I don't like, I, I don't, like I said, I don't usually, I don't usually like interracial romances because in the one or interracial relationships, because whenever I read them, you're always ignoring something that is wrong. And I don't ever like that we make excuses for that. So I don't ever like to engage in it. And then it's someone who throughout the story is just questionable in her blackness throughout the story. And it was like, hmm. Now, I like the story. I like the conversations that it came up with and things like that. So it, it meant something for me. And I like I would still encourage 
everybody, especially other black women to read it, but mo mostly so we could get engaged in conversation afterwards. Not solely because I don't think it won't impact you or I don't think it cannot be triggering or traumatic, but because it's a conversation that we need to have because it does encompass that all skin folk and kin folk conversation, which is a conversation that I'm sorry, but we need to have. And because all skin folk ain't kin folk, I don't read everybody solely because they're a black author. Because I do realize that there are things that they are doing, whether they want to admit it or not, that are detrimental to our community. Period. Well, the, the congregation of Shay have spoken. <laughs> and sometimes you just got to speak your truth. And listen. That would be a whole different conversation to talk about black writers who write things that we just can't get down with and support. Where it's like, I want to like this, but this is this is troubling that you put this in here. Right. And it doesn't seem ironic. It seems like you meant this. Right. Because the issue for me is these become the things that white people gravitate towards. Like the other yep. black girl, people are gravitating towards it and loving it and loving it. And I'm like, we're not spending enough time talking about the situation that created this story to even be needed. Right. Like we sell the book and we market the book as it's on about being black in a predominantly white space. The book has nothing to do with being black in publishing. Not and at all. Really, she could have had any other job. She could have been a teacher. She could have worked at the post office. She could have they drove the dang trash cans like none of the job had anything to do with the story but the way that it's marketed is like she's in this new wave she's talking about things that are part of the conversation this isn't a conversation caucasians are having at all like y'all are definitely not having the all skin folk and kin folk conversation because most of y'all don't even know what that sentence means so like it's also we gotta think about and not not think about but when you're saying like they will know what that means i also view white cultures as very and i should say white cultures in america as very individualistic versus black people are more collectivist so i don't even know how that phrase could even exist in white spaces in america that part that's very true brie it's just a different cultural priority 100%. But I agree that that book could have literally, the conversations it, it opens up could be, and are real good, but there are some things left undone that I'm like, it's troubling that you didn't, that you didn't want to make sure that was in here. It's troubling that you didn't want to make sure that we had the conversation about why this coping mechanism was, was here in the first place. Right. Veronica, Veronica Mars. Wait, Veronica and Betty, what comics? You the said Archie you comics. Know. Huh? The Archie comics? I have no idea. I'm thinking. I'm Isn't thinking. that where Veronica and Betty are from? The Archie comics? I was thinking, but. Erica, say it ain't wrong. Hmm? I was just agreeing with Shay, and I was like, I could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, you might have to explain that one a little bit more for us, literary lady. We we, yeah. we, we weren't catching on to that one as fast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for it now. There is a black romance writer who supposedly has a book coming out with a white guy on the cover. And you know what? So here's my thing. And people, I've heard this said, and I'm going to say this very clearly. And if anybody knows, I'm trying to stop cussing this Brit. But you can kiss my entire whole black ass with thinking that you can write about slavery and make it a romantic relationship between a black person and a white person. That's you can never, because the power dynamics were not and are not and cannot and will not ever be the same. It will always be Stockholm Syndrome, point blank, period. The, you know, we don't know that they could love, even if she did love him, it was because of Stockholm Syndrome, because you can't possibly truly love someone who will not allow you to live in a space where you matter. And what is the investment in this trend? Right, like why do, what does it make you feel? Like, is, it, is this about trying to make slavery wasn't as bad? People could still fall in love. Are you serious? I like, just don't get why people are trying to lighten slavery. How the fuck 
do you lighten slavery with rape that's what happened but like we're, that's not what you're talking about so i'm just like what what and that's the thing it's like if you want to talk about mixed race people and slavery then do it but then then say the whole truth they were mixed race because their mother ha- was raped like it, it's not because they fell in love and they were the first whatever that law is love v wait like they were the first one like no it was it was most of the time it was non-consensual and you just need to be able to sit in the room with that ghost and if you can't sit in the room then leave the room but don't attempt to change the room number it still is what it is it still is what it is child i can't even believe this exists. i just need to go back to it for a second because this cannot be real Tell me that there this are, is no, not there are multiple. There are multiple yeah, of it's black a trend. writers who do this. And the reason that it bothers me is because you're black, white people excuse it. Well, it can't be bad because a black person did it. No, it can. We can be wrong just like you because white supremacy runs through this system. Like, be very clear. In the white, black people can be anti-black. Black people can push anti-black rhetoric. Please don't get it twisted. Just because a black person does it does not mean it's okay. Exactly. Like, I just want to make sure we say that because yes. a lot of people run away with that, right? And it goes back to, um, and I think that was one thing that the, the other black girl uh, did that or talked about that is a conversation we don't have because we want to believe that all black people are going to stand up for us. And that's simply not the that's truth. Not the truth. In the book, it explores the topic of, remember last summer when um, they did those covers for the classics and put black people on the covers at Barnes and Noble and, and black people were like, there well, ain't no black people in this book. And we're like, did y'all have a black person in the room? The other black girl explores the topic of a black person being in the room and not saying nothing. Or a man in the BS. Because in our minds, would no black person a man this BS? All it takes is one. That's all they they need. need They just need one to say it's okay. Or to not say it's wrong. Right. To To not say it's wrong. Right. And that's why, like, when people are like, why do you always have to say something? Because if I don't, they will take the silence as agreement. And if I don't speak up and the next black person does, they're going to say that black person is argumentative. They're going to say that black person is aggressive because I didn't stand up too. And I don't want any other black person to feel like their voice is invalid when right. I knew it was wrong. Right. Period. And that is that communal paradigm of I'm thinking about the next black person who I don't know, probably never meet, but I know they're going to be down the line eventually. And I, God forbid it be, I be the citation for why they're going through hell. Not going to be me. That part. That part. Man. The Archie comments. We've gotten our clarification. I hope that. The people in the comment are really appreciating this unpaid labor that Brit and Shay is putting on y'all. I mean, just speaking their goddamn truth. I'm in awe to be in company, honestly. I just snaps in love and appreciation and accolades to Brit to Brit and Shay because y'all done y'all doing the work. And I appreciate all of y'all for your rawness and your candor. It needed to be said, damn it. Needed to be said. It did, and thank you for hosting, for framing, for moderating, Brie. Like, this conversation wouldn't be the same without every person on this screen, especially including you. Like, we're all doing oh, this yeah, together. Girl. It's beautiful. Like, for real, for real. Like, it had to be the group. Like, yes. Me and Brie already have our one on one conversations. It right. Had to be the group. It had to be the three of us. Wow. Uh Uh-oh. Which is why I can't, with the new Gilded Ones, I can't finish how the characters are so white, are so hyped up, yet she's being the black woman, yet being the black woman was seen as bad. Let's have a conversation. I didn't receive it that way, but I've only read it once. I'm I'm a fan of reading twice. So... It wasn't, so you're saying that the white, that you're not with it because the white girls were hyped up and you think that Deck and the other black girls were treated especially badly? Is that what you're saying? Clarify, please. I at all, so I have no input. And I'm not all the way through it, but I will say that this was, remember when I sent you that text 
because I was already I like, so. I yes. don't know. yeah, but because of how it was already framing that she was she was not as pretty or not as because she was oh, dark. okay. And so like that framing in the beginning, I know had already had me like dragging because okay. I thought it was like the other black fantasies we've been talking about where everybody was black. So I didn't realize yeah, no, they're the not. Where there weren't everybody wasn't black. And so then to hear them with the way they talked about her for not mm. the way that I'm reading the story so far, which I don't know. And I haven't finished. You can tell me this the way that I'm reading it. It sounds like she's biracial. Or like one of her parents yeah. might not might not be black. Well, he seems like he's like way different than her mom. Is the way the story is coming off to me so far. But again, I, I can't speak to... on that. It'd be a spoiler. Okay. Um, but what I will say is, I audio booked this. I have it in physical copy, and I'm going to read it again. So I'll read it in physical copy, and then I'll probably see the things when I audio book things. I'm just getting through. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not like. I'm I'm not engaging it as closely. I'm reading for the plot and the drama and the and the bombs going off. So I'll read it. I'll read it again because I heard that from I'm seeing that from literally. I heard that from Shay and then um one of my other critique partners was like, I don't know if I'm feeling the Gilded ones. And I was like, what? But I I I didn't see the the anti blackness or the entire anti blackness in Decca, which is a I I can't do it. I, like in any like in movies like that's my main issue with a wrinkle in time the movie is that is the internalized anti-blackness in that character so i'll go back in and i will probably see it but mm, man you hate to see it yep you do story time oh goodness um, i was in graduate, Hi, yanni. I was graduate school yanni and i was on the bus with mm. this probably really um solidified my cautiousness with friending white folks this pro this experience this experience probably probably really really sealed it up if you were there and you're watching you know what you did i'm exposing you it's just happening so in grad school i'm on the train and i'm on the train with i think about five other people who are white and in my program and this guy gets on the train he's a white man his best friend gets on the train a black man he kept looking at me and was i think he was trying to holler if if if, if uh if memory serves me correct and I was just not about him. Just the way he came at me, I, I didn't feel it. I, it wasn't given what it's supposed to have given, you know. So I'm sitting there. So then he starts belligerently calling me the N-word. He's like, no, in this and in that. I'm trying to let an N-word speak to an N-word. He's a white man coming at me. I look at his friend. I go, so my man, this, this cool with you? Man, you know, yeah, I just let him get the pass. You know, I just let. So you're okay with your white best friend keep calling me the N word. It's cool for you. This black black man, my skin color, allow this man to just keep calling me the N word, just repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And this, just your com your comment, Yanni, just really makes me think of like. I just don't understand certain mental processes of certain people. And when I'm saying certain people, I want to be clear. Black people who allow their white counterparts or use friendship as an excuse for white people to say violent things to other black people. So for me, this is this will be something I will never understand. And I get it. I'm a therapist and I'm supposed to be this, this, that, and the third. But this... I will never understand. I can never understand why it would be okay for you to just be like, yeah, I'm going to give you the pass. If you can say the N-word, no, it's fine. You say the N-word in my presence and you white, on-site is on-site and we no longer friends. Period. Right. I so I have two things on this. So um, I have uh, I, my oldest friend in the world is white. We've been friends since I was 12. So this is going on 18 years. So she's been a part of my life longer than she hasn't. Never in her life 
has she ever said the N-word to me? Never, ever, ever. She has dated black men, is dating a black man, has never, ever, ever said the N-word to me. Never, ever, ever been a thing. Ever, 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 ever been a thing. Knows how I feel about interracial relationships. Knows that they don't bother me in the effect that, like, I think that you should love who you love and be who would you be. But knows that I know that, like, that's not for me. And knows that I've tried it. Like, you know, I'm not one of those people that's like, I'm not going to ever do it. No, I tried it. I was like, ooh, it's definitely ain't for me. And hey, it's over and it's done with, right? So, like, the part that bothers me the most about the black people that do this is you don't ever tell your white friend, this doesn't apply to all black people. Like, be very clear. You can always talk to your friends differently than you can talk to strangers. So why y'all get a friend that says you can say this word and think you can go up to black people you don't know and say this word and there not be any repercussions makes no sense. That's like a stranger coming up to you and calling you a B word. You're not going to take that lightly. I just, I just... I don't understand how y'all know this word is heightened by violence. It's heightened by where it comes from and want to act like it's just a word. First of all, we know no word is just a word. Because if you get on the stand and say just some words and it's a lie, you're going to prison. So we know words got power is all I'm saying. So when y'all act like they don't, you you lose me. Really the math ain't mathing. Right. Because if we're being really true and honest right now, white people that are truly, truly friends with black people don't want to say that word. And would never say it. Would never. Because they don't have a reason to. There's millions of words in the fucking English dictionary. And you caught up on this? Right. This one word. And I will die on this hill. I will die on this hill that the only reason white people want to say it is because somebody told them they couldn't. And my thing is, if you are white and you are saying it and your black friends or black men, that's culture said, is allowing you to say it. I mean, not culture. Salter said. That means they are setting you up. It sounds like a setup to me. Because I personally don't believe so. You yeah, are sitting around and saying to somebody, me. and they're gonna be like, Come get these hands. You gonna get them hands. You gonna get them ancestral hands. Man, it's, it's like them uh, blow. It's like them traveling the when the uh when people do those fake traveling uh uh TikToks where it's like the best places to go somewhere, but they're all like hood spots that if you do pull up you probably gonna get robbed like that's what i feel like it is when a black person tell you you can say the n-word and just don't give you no other things they don't be like only say it to me they're like nah you can say it like low-key they want you to die if you ask me if you were to ask me if i ever told somebody that i am low-key praying for someone to do you harm is all i'm saying it's a setup that don't if that don't sound like a setup to me, well, baby, I, I don't know what one is. Yep. Mean hold on, hold on. Me. It's the way all of our heads cocked to the side when we were like, period. <laughs> in the words of Paul Mooney, everybody wanna be an N-word, but no nobody it wanna is. be an N-word. Hey, until it's about that time, then everybody. And if I could just, Kasha has, has said this before, but like, no, so everybody wants to be black until it's time to be black. That's a thing for sure. But then also nobody wants to be black, but let these reparations get passed. We reaching back in the ancestry. I have called it. I said, watch now. Okay. So this is me. I'm a numbers person, right? And like black history has like always been my thing. So if you look at the census data for black Americans from slavery on, like, right. So up until abolition becomes a thing, we are growing at above a half a percent every five, every 10 years. Abolition becomes a thing. It's looking like slavery is going to be a thing. We start dropping. We're not procreating. We're not we're not growing as a as a group. Right. Then we start coming together. We got our own communities. We're making our own little black meccas and whatnot. We start going up. Up, 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 up. Integration happens. Since 
1980 and the institution of integration and the welfare system and all these things, not one decade have we grown more than a half a percent as a group of people. I guarantee they pass reparations. We will grow up from what are we less than 12 percent? Like because they keep saying less 12, than but 13. Like it's like 12, like yeah, it's 13, but it's like less than that. It's like right, right at the cusp. I guarantee we grow. Guarantee we grow. It's been said on the chat in the in the live. When it happens, I want y'all to come back to this. All right. right. Like, Fight black women like, when it happens. Right, because remember, like they've been saying for like the last how many years that by 2040, we'll all uh, the majority of the country will be mixed. It's yeah. not possible because majority of the country is not mixing. Majority still marries their own races, Period. which we talked about in our interracial life too. Like that misconception, everything is the narrative, right? Everything is a story. The narrative is that everyone is in a mixed race relationship and that there are 10 babies running around everywhere and it's beautiful. And that's what's being pushed. Like literally, I have, I have read a couple of Talia Hibbert books, like a series of hers. And I like Talia Hibbert. I think her writing is great, but she does do primarily interracial. I don't know what audible. Hey, bring the queen's name in the room. Let's we love. Andrea House can get all my coin. I'm Everyone. Gonna- Every last dime of my coin, and y'all know I don't really be reading romance, but Alexandria, she can have it all at my house, get a chair at the crib, can get a corner dedicated to her greatness. What do you need to do? What do you need to do to help you write? What you need? Not only is it black love, black romance, these men are thick. Do you understand me? They are thick men, thick thighs, thick arms. It's just all around. First of all, can we say that there is hardly ever a bad black man in sight? For me, that is what I love. Like to not say black men slander is beautiful. Wow. Men who are loving you past all of your faults, because bruh, some of these chicks got faults out the booty hole, and they be like, "I love you still," and I'll be like, "Oh, where he at?" I'm going to slide up and down this pole. He was like, I still got you, queen. Period. And that's how I love it. I love it. Little lamb. (laughs) We are saying you need to add Alexandria House. I finished the the McLean Brothers series. Shout out to Britt because if it wasn't for her, I never would have found it out. I'm converting everyone I know. No, Britt can't. Man, so, yeah. set. I'm well, I mean, I would suggest you start with Everett because I started with Everett and Everett changed my life. So I would just suggest you start there. I and feel work like you should start with Jaws. I'm gonna say, yo, Jaws has to fart. Listen, I said, hold it, hold everything. Listen, Jaws can get all of this. You understand yeah. to me? I feel like that's the series I'm on now. I feel like that's the series I'm on. Them that's boys, the yes. She's on her way. She started to set the Jaws neck. Jaws neck. Oh my gosh. Listen, reading this book, I said, I don't, I didn't know I was into face sitting. But I could do it. I can do it. I can sit on a couple faces now, amen. I can Woo! sit on a couple faces now. Amen. Woo! Listen. I'm going to wait until marriage. And on that marriage night, I'll sit wherever I want to in Jesus' name. I mean, listen. In Jesus' name. Those who sit. I ain't going to finish it. But you know. In my head, I did. And listen. Book of Bree, chapter 1, verse 8. Listen. Those who lick. (laughs) Ah! Amen. Must then sit. And that's on what? Mary has. Mary has. A little lamb. Hey. Oh, is it hot in here? It, it's do you need a- I'm definitely like, let me tell you a- here real quick. Thank you, Yanni. Yeah. Yes, this conversation yeah. has definitely evolved. I can't We're taking off. a turn. Because the thing is, like, we can talk about Talia Hibber and Lisa Cole and their wonderful writing and their interracial and all that all day. Mm-hmm. But also, there are some Black writers out here who are giving us what we 
want and let's lift them up like we can critique those that we love and we can say like in a little blah, blah, blah. but yes, those who are doing it up with them up with right. them christina right. jones christina, yeah, christina c jones i was just about to say it yes 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 getting school was too cute i liked it it was cute it's done gay we don't see. Okay, I'm gonna have to read that. I read Annie Up and I wasn't a fan, but I'll read Getting School because I've heard a couple good things about that. Annie Up, I did not like the man. The girl, I was like, girl, you holding it down. But the dude, I was like, I would fight you and not in a cute way. Damn. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah, I started with Getting Schooled. Um, Ashley Bookishram, shout out. She recommended Christina C. Jones to me, and that's what I started with. And uh, I Pineapples. Like when I tell y'all I have no less than three Alexandria House swag titties. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not. I have I have a black one that's a pineapple, and it has all it has all of their names, like their names and also the things that they say. So like it has Nolanese on there because you know Nolan can't say nothing right. Like and then it has and I got oh, one of my. Um, so funny though. Nolan. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah, needs Nolan. Bridget. He He's trying to get his feet in. It's it's quickie, baby. It's quickie. And that was my favorite book out of all of them. But really? I I Let me tell you. But I think it's because Bridget was like, like personality wise was more like. I knew you were going to love Bridget. Right. Because I was like, oh, if y'all don't stand up for yourselves, I'm going to be so upset. Like everybody else is making me mad. But like, no, like Bridget, I like Bridget. But I, I think that honestly, the only one I didn't like that was like a three for me was the um the basketball one. Let and me was, hold you. Let me hold you. But I was on because I just did not like the female. Like I, I knew the you boy. weren't gonna like Kim. I was like, I hope she don't quit on the series because of Kim. Um, no, I to be honest, I started it and quit with that one. See, because it was just too much for me. Like I just, mm, I just did not. Leland like is it. a king. Leland but, is like, a why king. Kim? What's going on? I mean, you've been through a lot of trauma, so let me check in with Bree. I don't know how that worked. You know, she's been through a lot of trauma since she was young, so I'm sure that pay that pay plays a lot into while she was behaving like a child. Um, but I'm like, how this man who is mid, who's like a decade, you're a senior. Bree said, I'm, I'm actually hot. Uh, well, how, how this man who was like a decade, well, no, he was, no, he wasn't even that much younger, like five years or something younger than her. But how he acting big grown and you over here hiding from your son? Lady, like. I just, yeah, it was too much for me. And so like, <sighs> It just, for me, it just reiterated why, like, trauma is real and having trauma is very, very real. And I'm not going to ever negate people having that. But it's yes. also why dealing with and healing from your trauma is very real and important. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that you have trauma and acknowledging I've been through traumatic things is not healing from it. No. And it's not making it any better. No. Like, she was constantly talking about, like, what she'd been through. But, like, what are you doing to change? Yes. What he's been through. People like, like to talk about what they've been through. And like right. I said, doing the work on healing fucking sucks. It's hard. You're going to face things that you never wanted to. You're going to face aspects of yourself that you don't like. It's not easy. There's no walk in the park here, but it needs to be done. Right. 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 Because uh, otherwise it's dumping. Otherwise, yeah. it's dumping. Like, yes, Leland is wonderful, but like, that's it's not his responsibility to rescue you. Right. We don't like seeing those tropes, and I don't like that for you because I don't want you to think that you would be nothing without Leland. Now, I think Leland is freaking amazing, and I am now a fan of beards. But I, I don't wait, want wait, you to wait, think wasn't before. I didn't see the value in them, but now I definitely do. Oh wow! Mm, I wow. mean, pi like pineapples and beards. I'm like, wow, what a world! Listen, a black man, a dark skin, a black, black man with a beard is my Achilles heel. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I like mine is chocolate, so let him be chocolate with a beard, and you got That's me. what I just said. I just oh, okay, I didn't hear the chocolate part. I was like, yeah, let him be chocolate, and you got. I just mm. I'm talking about so chocolate. You looking like 3 a.m. in the morning? Amen. Hey, hey. Beard, that, hey. Be, that be it. And don't let me have pretty right teeth. 
Oh my God. Listen, oh, against the skin. You look like a black man with a good smile. Amen. We love that. Hmm. And you you talk looking at me, talking about you gonna pick, you gonna pick this up. This girl ain't small. That's what you're going to think this up. Listen. Hey. Oh, hey. All right. Yes. 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 Hey. Man. Well, you know, they got weight on the Lord. Amen. I trust you. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Ask and it shall be given. Hey. 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 You got to pray with specificity. I'll tell you that part. If you got to pray with specificity. You got to say, Lord, now I know. That I was like a dark skinned, skinned man with a beard and a white smile who can handle me in full because I've waited on you. So I'm praying with specificity and I want this to be bound in heaven and on earth. Thank you very much. Listen, and don't let you be fat also. Your little thickums, little fluffy. Oh, yeah, no. Like, like I'm in love. Oh, man. Tell me. Everything. Did you read Let Me Please You? I have not. Tommy Little Thickums. That's Listen, what Tommy and uh let me pat you your sister. sister. Yeah, that's the novella one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. let me please you. I'm just saying yeah, I, I'm not a type, not afraid to say it. That's yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. Not afraid. Not afraid. And all of her books are good. Like, and that's the thing, like it's very it's rare for me to have like an automatic read because I'm really picky and I may not like all of your stuff. But like Alexandria House is an automatic read for me. Automatic read. Period. Like across her series, I'm like, I trust you. You should. I really trust you. You really should. I like cosign this. I literally do. Like she this her, i don't know her other i can't think of like the series title but the, her book real love with hassan and i can't think of the girl's name hassan that's thick with the tattoos and that and the 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 female main character she had a little she had a little hood in there she was like i want you to know that if you that if you cheat on me i will fight you and she thought that he had cheated on her and she definitely fought him. He was like, you're not going to choose. I want you to stay away from me right now, which reminds me of Shay saying, I need you to back across the room from me right now. And he did it. He came close. He was like, you're not going to hit me. She popped that man dead in his face. <laughs> I, I am a firm believer in try Jesus. Not, not me. me. Not me. Because I, I, find like, I don't, I don't turn the other cheek. I don't. Petty. I wasn't born of a virgin halfway. Like I'm, I'm. I was born from a very non-virgin who would definitely knock you the f out. So like, nah. Like I'm just not that person. I'm just not. I'm a firm believer of I'm not raising nobody's baby. Period. I don't even. Yeah, I don't even want kids. Please. I don't. am not raising nobody's baby. So if I am what you want. You Must need grow to up. with food already on your plate. Huh? That part. I'm Don't not feeding you. I'm not raising nobody's baby. Don't miss the mm -hmm. message. And if you come with me, if you come at me and fix your mouth and say you're intimidating, on site is on site. Goodbye. Because if Goodbye. one more, if one more man tell me I'm job. intimidating, they gonna get these hands. I did my job if I'm intimidating because you obviously can't handle me. So goodbye. You it's are called screening, dear. You it's are screening. screening. Goodbye. Like simple. It's called thing. screening. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. You know, not everybody gets the screening process. So get through. here's the thing. Everybody ain't able, and that's fine. It's okay. It's not cute for everybody. It's okay. It's cool. it's cool. I understand I'm not everybody's cup of tea and am not trying to be. I'm trying to screen them out. Are you saying you've been screened? Is that what you're saying? It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Are you saying you've been screened? It's okay. I'm not going to. Okay. Grit, you are too bad. 
I'm, I, I, are you saying that you have been screened? Are you reporting that you've been screened to me? <laughs> no reporting. <laughs> it's okay. I'm all right with it. I'm not hurt. Right. See, because here's oh, the issue period. with grown up kids. Grown up kids think they adults. That's their biggest issue. I mean, what's the conversation we're even having? You can't say you, you're not as mature as you think you are. I'm grown. If you have to tell me that you're grown, then there might be something missing from your recipe. But I, it's not my responsibility to tell you what it is. So what you're saying is you've been screened. It's okay. Also, I think we have to admit that grown has very different definitions for people. That's true. Because some what some of y'all believe is grown is legitimately just turning 18. And for me, that's not it. I don't no. think I was grown at 18. I'm going to be honest with you. No, I wasn't. I think I turned grown in my in my mid to late 20s. I, I think I was grown at 25. I don't think before then I was grown. I think at any time before that, I was a young adult. But I was not right. an adult. Like I, I was, but I also feel like am I really grown? I still ask my daddy for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, it, and I, like again, I feel like like it also just depends, right? So like for me, I have been living on my own, like paying my own rent since I was a junior in high school at sixteen. So for me, by all intents and purposes, and the fact that I got emancipated, I legally was an adult yeah. long before most people were. Yeah. But even knowing that and knowing that I was doing very adult things, looking back, I was not an adult till I was 25 because I was still making very childish decisions. But because I could do other adult things, I thought I was an adult. And I feel like that's the biggest misconception that you take care of yourself or you pay your rent or you pay a phone bill or whatever. And now you're an adult. Like, no, 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 no. You are just learning how to do responsibilities. That does not necessarily mean you have reached adulthood mentally. Yeah, I, I usually think of adulthood as providing or like taking care of oneself. And I don't know why I do, but that's like my default. But for me, I feel like mentally, I was an adult when my nephew was born and I was seven. I had to, I had to take care of him. I had to, like, it was me and my sister trying to figure that out. You understand me? So, and I had a lot of trauma. So I had to grow up real fast. <laughs> Just pew, had to really get up there. So for me, I felt like I was making adult, like thinking, processing like an adult very young. But I ain't gonna lie. I called my mama last week. I said, are you or are you not buying me some shoes at DSW? That's really what we're talking about right now. Are you spending your coin? And is your coin extending to come and visit me? Because you went and visit your mama last week and you think I can't get a visit? So at this point, it's a hate crime. She started laughing because she likes that. She likes when I get like very animated. So literally, I was like, Sheila, are you going to give me $20 or not? Like, I want Dairy Queen slow sheets. Are you going to contribute? So, I mean, I'm still waiting on a TV for my dad. So for me, it feels like, am I really an adult? Because I'm like, you said you were going to give me Roku. Ain't no Roku in here, okay? And that's another thing that has, like, been a thing for me. Because, like, so I'm the grandchild. My grandmother raised me. Mm -hmm. And there are four kids, my mom and her three siblings above me, like, generation-wise. In my family, every single one of those adults have been able to come to either one of my grandparents for money. That was never a thing for me. And I have always been the youngest, right? Because I'm a whole generation below y'all. Yeah. Like, and for me, I always was like, I wore that as like a badge of honor that like y'all didn't ever have to bail me out of a situation. I was always like financially ready and financially good. And I realized one, that me thinking of that as a negative was also a part of trauma and not understanding things and not really understanding how family is supposed to be, right? And then two, also that like, yo, there are a lot of people that have a lot more privileges than other people and don't realize it. Like, to have a parent to call to be able to do anything is a privilege. Like, right? Like, when we talk about privilege, uh, we, we were talking about it earlier, and I was thinking about this, and I was like, yo, the fact that some of us grew up with books in the home is a privilege. privilege. Because there are people that don't. When I was a child, I thought everybody grew up with books in the house. We have books everywhere. I was an adult when I found out that, like, my grandma was special in doing that. Yeah. 
Like, it's that's just so many different things. things that, like, yeah. That's one of my hiccups with book two and also my memory. So I tell people mm. a lot of times that if you experience um, childhood trauma, it can really affect your memory versus if stuff is not going to really help you for survival, other things won't get as imprinted as if you didn't have that adversity, right? So lately I've been trying to ask my sister's friends like what they remember of me. And what they remember is me reading. I don't remember reading at all. Like I don't remember it at all. But to them, I think, I don't know. Who knows what the truth is? But that is what they're saying. But I didn't grow up with books. So when I'm on, I'm on, or my conception is I didn't grow up with an access to books like you, Shay. So when I am doing tags or people are just in conversation on booktube about reading, I read this when I was seven and sat there and I'm like, nope. Because me reading books didn't really start until college. So I'm just like, so that kind of like, I don't know, like we were talking about earlier of me trying to be like more cognizant of me being human and like having flaws. I do get jealous about that. So 100%. Not to say like, I hear you. No, and like for me, like I, for me internally, I would get jealous when I would like meet people who had like parents they could call at like the drop of a hat, like somebody who didn't have to like, like struggle to find some help. Like, because like, I would think like, dang, why didn't I get that? Why don't I deserve that too, right? And it's also learning that like, just because somebody has something that you don't have, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Right. Yeah. Like one thing we don't talk about specifically in black in the black community is we don't ever talk about bad moms. We talk about bad dads all the time. And as somebody who had a bad mom, it was way worse dealing with Mother's Day than Father's Day would ever be because most people have bad daddies. So we could all commi commiserate over bad daddies like we all knew what it was like. But everybody had their mama. And it's like the whole world tells you that if there's anybody that's always going to be on your side, it's your mama. And so to be the person that has to live with your mama not being that person and everybody telling you that she should be that person is a whole different battle. And so, like, for me, like, my grandmother was amazing and we had a lot of great things. She did a lot of bad things. She did a lot of great things. But because I'm a child at the time and because of how children process things so many more times in my head there was emphasis on the person that wasn't there and not the person that was because yeah. again you're a child and that's how you process things and that's why like for me when we're talking about trauma people healing from it is such an important thing because sometimes your trauma is the one thing that you focused on and you missed all the other good things that happened right? Like my grandmother, she was abusive. I can admit that. I can know that. But I can also know that in her being abusive, it was her attempt to do better with the second generation than she did with the first one. The right. second generation, you came out with four college graduates, no kids without marriage, like any of those things. The first one, you only got two people to graduate from high school. So you obviously did something better. You still didn't do it perfectly, but you're human and I can accept that while still acknowledging you messed up. Right. But acknowledging that you've made sacrifices so that you could do better. And right. I think that so many times within our community, that's something that we don't acknowledge. We're so big to harp on the bad because we want to talk about it that we don't acknowledge that sometimes there are good things even in this darkness. Amen. Beautifully said. Write that down for a book title, ma'am. Yes, oh, you up above me. There are good things even in this darkness. What? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. A book, a poem, something. The people got to eat off that. What? Also, it's funny, literary lady, I was homeschooled as well. Um, and so, like, in the fact that she homeschooled us, like, as much as it, like, at the time I was sad about it because I wasn't around people, like, the library and her homeschooling us, man, man. The library was the joint. That's Man, what I read. The there. summer reading program? Ooh, what? Oh, bro. I was in there. Oh, First of all, hey. the fact that we got meals for reading books, can we talk about it? Can and you talk about it? reading meals? Like not understanding that kids were reading to feed themselves. Let's talk about Guys, it. This. It was the snacks at the library for me. They knew mm -hmm. I was coming for the Junie B. Jones. Don't act like you don't know why I'm here. 
for the yeah, snack. I love a snack. My dedication to libraries. I swear, I feel like if I ever have a will and have a, a little absolutely a change i'm oh, gonna yeah. get back to the library b man. to go to the library we That's only cool. have like in tulsa there are like um for those of you guys who don't know i'm from tulsa oklahoma and so like in tulsa there like y'all everybody knows like black washi but there's like um there's only two libraries in the black part of town mind you there's like 20 libraries in the whole city there's only like two there's only two in the black side of town and i have like always said like that's one thing i want to do is i want to donate because like there were so many times they tried to close these libraries down and it was like y'all already took away our community centers y'all took away our swimming pools like these are the last things that we have to keep us from you know from bad stuff happening right like people don't realize when you close pools community centers and libraries what do you give people to do you're getting rid of all the positive outlets for them. Man, a word is a exactly. word. Truly. Yo, we're creeping up on three hours and uh, 23 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we own three hours and 23 right. minutes. We no creeping. We're creeping up on, we done passed. Three. Right, we doing the whole Cupid Shuffle on 323. Right. People really out here hanging out. That's the thing. Right. We appreciate it. They said we're here to eat. I think the little free libraries are awesome. I love a little free library. The other thing that you you we have to acknowledge is that the libraries require you to have an address. For people like me who did not have an address at certain important times in my life. That meant not getting the library card. Yeah. My access being changed. So like I am a hundred. I honestly am with anything that allows people to be able to read because yeah. I don't think anybody for any reason should be prohibited or kept from being able to read. 100%. I agree. I agree. 100%. I agree. 100%. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Man, the struggle. Man, so seriously. I, mean, I was still in, not still, but I was borrowing my <laughs> friend's library cards that they gave to me because I didn't have a library card while I was in Ukraine and I wanted to read. So my friends would just give me their numbers because mm -hmm. you have to have a U.S. address and like all this shit. And I was like, just give me the card. <laughs> give me the card. Goddamn card. Um, yeah. For um, me, the it wasn't, I don't remember having like super lots of books in my home. Well, not for me, like because my dad wasn't. As, was an elder and a preacher so there were lots of books but they were not for us they were like bible commentaries but we saw them and he's an english teacher and has been all of my life so i always had that and so i just remember because not even books right like literacy in general for me has always been a big part of my life and like as i'm in come on hustle to get a library card um i for me now, literacy is a huge is a huge part of my of the work that I do and that I'm interested in being innovative around. So, and I just remember in fifth grade, my English well, not English because we had one teacher in fifth grade. My teacher was talking to my dad at parent teacher conferences, and she was like, um, "Brittany is having trouble with the five paragraph essay. She just doesn't get it," which I didn't. Um, and he was like, "Okay," and from then on. He's he stayed up with me till the midnight hour. T I and I, I mean the midnight hour. Like my mom was like, all right, I'm gonna lay down. Because God was gonna turn it around. Hey, God's about to do it, Tasha Cobb said. God's about to do it. Hey, God, you can blow my mind. Wow, don't get me going in church. I love God. I love him so much. He's amazing. <laughs> He's amazing. Oh, He's so good. Yes. His history is consistent. I love him. <laughs> I love him. I do. I do. So, but he said it would be the midnight hour teaching me a five paragraph essay format. And to me now looking back when I'm looking at my, my students, whether I'm, whether I'm teaching a class, TAing a class or whether I'm, I'm coming in contact with them in the writing center at my university, 
I, I sure will. I'll praise him in advance for what he's about to do for me. Um, I, I'm just stricken by the fact that like, wow, my dad, I'm sure there are lots of parents who will stay up with their children and watch them do the work and wish that they could help them, but cannot. But my dad wasn't just staying up supervising me write the essay. He was, he was, he had me write it. He would stay up and try to stay awake because he was, he had class. He, he was teaching high schoolers. God bless them. And so he had to, he had to go to work the next morning too. But he would let me write the essay, come back and check it and say point one supposed to be. It's, I don't know why it was so easy. I don't know what, I don't know what I was struggling with, but he did that for me. Not all parents can. And so to have a parent in the home who, whose career is literacy, who has that expertise and who can make that important and available to you and say like, here's how you're like to have those foundations in place so that when I am in college, certain things are just second nature to me. And I remember that when I have students who, and I, and I look, read the writing and I'm just like, there's something fundamentally off with this writing. Like fun, like something that should have been addressed years ago. So one, the teacher didn't do their job. Teacher just passing stuff through. But then like, well, the parents should have helped. You don't know what that parent's job is. You don't know if that parent is a functioning illiterate. So one day we'll talk about how No Child Left Behind actually hindered more black students than it helped. Shay with the STEM. Shay with the STEM. And no, she didn't just literally mic drop that. We just drop that mic. Literally mic drop that. Like, we're going to have to talk about how y'all excuse was it was going to get black students and like graduated and out. But then we have black students entering into college because they technically do have a high school diploma and are right. not adequately prepared. Not because it's solely their fault. Structural. Because you should have never been able to graduate without it. Like you shouldn't. You exactly. Shouldn't. You should like it's a thing. It's part of the reason why like I I've been a tutor since I was ten years old. Math has always been my thing. Math and science has always been my thing. I have been tutoring math like the entire like majority of my life because I am convinced that most people think they're not good at math because most p teachers don't want to teach in multiple ways to multiple students. Mm. They have one way that they want to teach. And that if is you true. it that way, it's done. That's not how math and science works for most people. Right. Like, it's just not. That's true. Especially when you start throwing in letters and shapes and stuff. I was done. I was very discouraged at the, right. at the existence of trigonometry. I said, trigger what? I don't want to do it. I was right. discouraged by the title. Mm -mm. And then let's not throw in the lack of female teachers in that in that space in most places and don't black, say black, black. hey teachers, there we go right and so like for me i know that i didn't have those same problems that other people had in that because i went to a predominantly black school so our science teachers were black our math teachers were black so i didn't have nobody telling me that as a black girl i couldn't do math and science because it was a black woman teaching me those things and again i didn't think it was a privilege because i go to the worst high school in my city Mm. But there's something about seeing somebody that it's looks true. like you. Amen. It's true. Doing something and telling you that you can do it too. And yeah. like it's saying that like, explicitly. Right. Right. Like it's not like, and, oh, because you see, like I literally would walk by black teachers, black math teachers. My school was predominantly black. Most of the teachers were black. But like walking by a, a math teacher who was black and she was, she kept her students ate lunch in her classroom. She was like, go get your lunch, come back because y'all need more time and we're going to get it. But guess what? That was supposed to be her lunchtime too. Like that, like the sacrifice of that, of her saying, literally saying, they think y'all can't do this, but you can. So tell me where you're getting stuck and I'll get you there. Just that, that, that confidence and that surety of, I will get you there. It's like, I was like, that felt like a hug to me because I really wanted to cry when I was in math class for real. I, I just, wanted to break down and cry. I just really feel so happy for y'all experiences and equally jealous. Say it. So, I just, man, what wonderful to have representation right there. You know what I mean? Like my mom didn't go past 10th grade and my dad didn't mm -hmm. go past third. 
my dad taught himself how to read. And then when I didn't know a word, he said, here's a dictionary, essentially. So mm-hmm. the fact that I even have a master's, it's like, what? To Amen. my what So do do it? it's just like, I remember having a white teacher in algebra and having being in an AP class for English. And the white woman told me that I can never like learn. I can't write a sentence is what she told me. So she petitioned and made me get into a class that was not AP English. And that math teacher told me that he failed me because I was black when me and this other white girl was studying and was struggling with the material. And he gave her a higher grade and we essentially got the same answers on the test. So I say that to say, y'all really, really had good representation. You know, now as an adult, you know, I'm, I'm big on being an auntie. I wish a bitch would. <laughs> so I try to show- Aunties are so people. important. Yeah, I just try to show it for the little ones. Yes. Because, you know, you got to. And I'm not the, I'm not great at math. Like stats, your girl love a stats. What? <laughs> I can do stats back and forth, up and down. But, you know, the trig is an issue. Sometimes I'd be like, it's two plus two, really four. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not here in Greece, but I'm like, your girl's life been blessed with what I have. Amen. Y'all out here just really thriving. I just wanted to give y'all y'all roses while you're here. Oh, amen. Well, the thing is, I I was lucky because there there were black teachers at that school who so my dad my dad has like 15 jobs. He was an English teacher and he also was the head basketball coach. So like he's interacting with students on multiple levels. So like they have to have a 2.5 to be able to play. So he's seeing his players' report cards and he's seeing Y'all all have this one teacher. Let's call him. Let's call her Miss Applewhite. As a throwback to my history teacher in college, he always called every teacher Miss Applewhite or Miss Applebottom, what he called her. So Miss Applebottom, the math teacher. All his play or seven of his fifteen players have Miss Applebottom. All of them got D's and F's. He was like, now as a teacher, who was also a basketball coach. Which is when my mother reminds him that he is. You're not a basketball coach who teaches English. You're an English teacher who happens to teach basketball. Thank you. Th- yes, mother. We're moving on. So get you together. Get you together. Get you together. Get you okay. Together. She's like, Here's the order of that operation. So that's all the math you're getting from me. So he was like, as a teacher, if most of your students are failing, that is a reflection of you. And so he he's, he's been at that school since 1995, which is when I was born. And so when I, when me and my sister got to that school, when it was time for students to pick out their, their schedules, he, like most of the students were just checking things off. We were all in the room together, just checking it off. My dad came into the room, excuse me, what's that? No, you're not taking her because she's filling most of my players. So you're going to have Miss Ball because white woman, right? So there was a black math teacher at the school who was failing most of her students and had smoke for them all the time. But he was well, there's a white woman who I know will explain things to you multiple ways because I know that you need that in math. Yes, I do. So like it was, it was there were teachers there who were willing to do the work. And there, I also had a dad who had worked at that school for a long time and knew what classes to put me in to succeed because he had seen so many kids fail in other classes. And that's the other shame. It's like sometimes we show up in those places in those spaces and we are we are a saving grace. And sometimes we create hellfire for students and it makes it worse that we look like them. That part. Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies because again, that's when we turn respectability out of a tactic and into a weapon to use against each other. Because Mm. if my person doesn't speak the way that I think that they should speak, then they're not worthy of me giving them this chance. I need to give it to another black person who's more worthy. Right, right. Who's already succeeding, so I'm gonna push them instead of helping someone to succeed. Right, right. Um, There's a movie that deals with this specific topic is called Luke or Loose? Loose. I think it's called Loose. It's like short for like Lucid. And it's a black boy from Africa who's been adopted by this white couple. And he has this black teacher who, because 
he's like the poster child for the school does everything to push him forward and doesn't do the same thing for other black male students in the school. So mm. like something happens and it's clear that loose could probably be a problem, but I'd rather get this other student in trouble than loose because mm. loose has a chance to stand up for us. Like he's yep. that one. He's that good. What is it? What's that? What's that? What's that title? Okay. That the, no, it's a book by somebody and it's called the, um, the good black kids. Or something. Oh, like oh the, that. yes. Oh, yeah, the Black People like, like Christina Hammonds? I, I, I think so. I haven't read it yet. But I think it makes me two titles. Of, the title made me think of that, like where it's that, that good child. Like, this is the Black person you need to be trying to be and emulate and be like. So, this is the one we're going to push forward. And I, I think that that, that, that that creates, that does create an issue. Right, it does. It creates a very bad issue because then there are people who, just because they don't dress or they don't speak, the way that you would want them to speak, they don't get those efforts. Um, there was a, 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 a educator in Chicago, um, uh, Marva Collins, and Marva Collins, she would take um, black children who had been like called, you know, um, that R word that we no longer say, mm -hmm. and have had been born with uh, drugs in their system, and they'd never have the education past a five-year-old, and in one year had these black students surpassing everybody that was in their age category and beyond. Because instead of taking these things that we're told because our race limits us from being able to overcome mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And actually focusing on the child, the mental health, how to teach that child, how to learn, how to engage with that child in a way that they can understand. We know that there are multiple learning styles. Why are we not making sure that as a exactly. teacher, you can teach in these multiple, multiple. learning styles? Please. If you don't at the very least have one teacher that can teach in every single one, you need to at least have teachers that can teach in multiple because right. you are automatically right. discounting one group of people just because they simply don't learn the way you want them to. Right, right. That's not also, how things also. go. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, oh, no. Continue, continue. No, you're good. You're saying also. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, um, I want to attest to Marva Collins. So my grandma found out about her and then she had a school in Milwaukee. So every one of my cousins but me went from first grade to uh, 12th grade and graduated from her school. And man, you can tell the difference of their education and mine. Just really good. I went to a school in Oklahoma that was also founded like off of her curriculum. Yeah. Um, when I was in first grade, um, I could already read. But because they hadn't taught us how to read and I would go grab books off the shelf, I kept getting in trouble. And yeah. so the teacher finally was like, well, maybe this isn't the class for her. They decide to test us because up until that point, for two years, preschool, kindergarten, I had went to that Marva Collins Bay school. I tested at a third grade level in the first grade. Come on. This is a, a, a three pound drug addicted born crack baby that they swore and told my grandmother and nine months old, I'd be disabled for the rest of my life. Yeah. Legit, legitimately, that wasn't the case. But it's also because the expectations that they have for us as black children are so small, are so small. Like the reason that black football players are suing the NFL is because not because they don't believe that the black kid, black men are being injured. It's because the level at which they start out black men's intelligence is already so low that whatever happens is not as bad enough of an effect for them to have truly had any kind of deficit. Like when you think about that, you're legitimately saying that you don't think we're at all intelligent so that whatever traumatic brain injury we had, it doesn't even matter because we weren't that smart to begin with. Like these are legitimate things that that that, that affect us, and you have doctors today who will who will die on a hill and say that black people aren't as intelligent, that black people don't feel pain the same way, that black people can endure more because they the trauma. Hurt like these are things that spaces of trauma. Yeah, we just had a French doctor say that, didn't he? Right. Yeah. 
but racism doesn't exist anymore. Oh, yay! Yay! That's always a great comment to see. Isn't it? Y equals MX plus B? Ha <laughs> Listen, what is that, slope? Yep. So oh, look, at, look at look at the girl. Mm. Man, this. So remember, I was uh, living on my own my junior and senior year. My my senior year, uh, my junior and senior year, I was getting ready to take the ACT every time one of my math teachers took me, whether it was like a math teacher I had the year before or the math teacher I had, somebody always made sure I got to the ACT because like, we were going to get me to college. Like that was the one thing we were going to do. Um, there was this math teacher that I knew through my math teachers, but I never had her for a class. Her and her church, she was Catholic. I never went to her church, never got to meet any of these people, decided that they were going to pitch in and they got me my very first laptop for college. Solely like off of that. So like when I like... Teachers to me are like the best humans in the world. And so when I meet a bad teacher or a teacher that chooses to do bad by their students, it really, really hurts because you have such a profound effect on students, specifically because even in your home, you are around your teachers more time than you're around your parents. Those people have a bigger effect on you. And so, like, when you meet teachers that don't take that job seriously or don't care to make sure that their students learn, like, it's like, why did you even choose this job? You know, Shay, it's so interesting that you say that because my, so I was, so Teach for America is part of AmeriCorps. They, they send teachers to high needs areas or whatever across the country. So they they had a high uh, heavy presence uh of, for recruitment on my college campus in memphis tennessee a lot and i went to rhodes college a lot of a lot of um graduates would do tfa for a year or two and some of them would stay at that school and you know have a career in teaching some of them would go into policy or like classroom adjacent roles they call it working with education policy and that sort of thing but the thing with tfa because i my I'm in a sorority. My my ace went into TFA. Black woman. Amazing. But she, a lot of the people in her TFA class were white. And there was a heavy presence in the air of white saviorism. Oh, yeah. Because you, you're, you're going, right. So you're going into these high need areas. Most of these are non-black communities. I mean, not white communities, and specifically in Memphis, the mo when I would in 2017 at least, the mobility rate and Memphis like educational poverty and economic poverty are existing like twins. They're rampant. You have kids go like that. There are schools that are um, have a 33 percent mobility rate. So one third of the student population is going to be somewhere else by the end of the school year. All their data gone. We don't know if they have educational um, disabilities. We don't know what their learning style is. We don't know what their test scores are. None of that. All their data is just gone. So they're coming in and the teacher doesn't know how to help them. Kids walking to school through literal gang war zones. The, the, the average trafficking age in Memphis is 13. So it's just like these kids are coming to school and it's heavy and you want to save them. You don't have a lick of cultural competence. You don't know. You don't know how how to help. You just know all these really like galling educational statistic facts about Memphis. If you know that, if you did the reading. But the thing is, like, that people teachers come in to TFA into these high need areas, and they want to be Marva. They want to be superstars. They want to like turn it around by themselves. And it's like that. You know, that's like exceptional. Right, like that's a rock star teacher. TFA is not going to teach you to be a rock star teacher. Rock star teachers may come to TFA and be made better, but they're not going to teach you to do that. And so, and also, like you have to, if you come in with white saviorism, it's not going to help anybody. But like what what she, what my ace was telling me was that there's a lot of people in there who just want to save, as opposed to really thinking about what are your students' needs like talking to them as whole students. So having the conversation of you're going to sit here and learn that she was a science teacher. You're going to sit here and learn this equation because they think you can't. And I know that you can. You're in this classroom acting like 
what they think you are because that's what they call you. They call you rowdy and uncooperative and belligerent. And so you behave this way, but that's not acceptable in my classroom because I know that you can do better than that. And I'm going to make you do your best. Sit down. And, and teachers coming to her like, Miss, let's call her Miss Smith. I don't want to throw her name out there. Miss Smith, does, does so-and-so behave like this in your class? No, he does not. He's, I can't get him to sit down in my classroom. She do a drop on the classroom. Sit down. Coming to your classroom to tell your children to sit down. And they do. Why do you, like, it's, you don't have a rapport with them. Because they can sense that all you want to do is save them. And it, that's not authentic. That's not real. So I'm like, to be a, to be a teacher, it's, if you don't have a heart for service, for me, when I don't, I, for me, if you don't have a heart for service, and like really trying to meet the need and being willing to say something five times, five different ways, which, you know, happens. If you're not willing to do that, then don't do it. Cause like, you're going to have to repeat every single thing you say. Yeah. Um, 5,000 so, times. So my experience with TFA is like a few years before, cause TFA had like a big presence in, um, in, um, on my campus when I was an undergrad mm -hmm. um, and I graduated in like 2013. So, um, the the thing i had multiple issues with tfa like i was excited about it and i wanted to do it because i was like oh okay this is already something i want to do right and it, it presses pause on them good old loans i only got a few but i still want to get them pause you know that double major life you kind of gotta go ahead and knock some stuff out and that's where i was so y'all five years no time off every summer sucked 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 hated it you did but tfa uh, no, no, no. I was talking about like uh, undergrad. So th this is oh, me like getting ready to train for TFA. So I'm like, okay. I'm doing all the, like I'm a part of their cohorts. I'm going and I'm speaking to new people who are getting recruited even before I like have applied type thing because they're big in the school that I went to high school in. And they met me because I was already there volunteering in my high school because it's not a, I don't need you to pay me to do this because this is already my thing. That's the first thing that you have to acknowledge. TFA for the most part, are people who are doing things that they would not be doing was the money not there. Were their loans not getting put on hold? Were they not getting that $10,000 check? This wouldn't be something that, that they were a part of. So that's that the part. first thing. The second thing is doing TFA looks huge when you're trying to go to law school. I know because that's where most of the people I know who signed up for TFA and did it are at now. It makes you look way more diverse, way more whatever than you actually are. That is also why they don't stay. They do their two years and they gone. It's not the people who end up doing it and fall in love with it and fall in love with the change are the people that are there years and years that stay after that when they stuck with that 20 something thousand and not getting that extra 10. Like them is the ones. But like what TFA does that bothered me was I had a 3.2. Anybody that knows college knows a 3.2 is not nothing to like be upset about. Like a 3.2 is a decent GPA, especially STEM and a double major, right? They were coaching me. The guy who had had me speaking to conferences for them was coaching me because my GPA was lower than the average that they accepted. Here's what that told me. I already know that I have one of the higher GPAs for the people in the black community. I know that as a fact. That means that because you're using this GPA requirement, you are already cutting down how many people that look like the students you want to serve that are gonna be in that. The reason this is an issue is we all know the GPAs do not mean that you are capable of doing your job. We also know that a lot of people with higher GPAs than us, the only thing they really had was money to pay somebody to do the things to keep their GPA higher. I know because I used to get paid. Like, it was a thing. Quickly stopped when I was like, mm, you're getting a B at a GPA because I've done this four times by the time I'm doing yours. And I did mine on the first try. So let me not help you get any further ahead of me than you're already getting without my help. But when your girl needed money, it was a thing that she did. So like, but like, it's a, it's a truth that you're keeping people that look like the students that you're saying need all this help from being there. Like you are keeping them from being able to see people that look like them. And as much as you may want to help and be a part of TFA, 
the fact that you don't look like them and you are telling them that all it takes is hard work and focus to get somewhere is not making the lesson happen like you think it is. And that's a not white person, all it takes. Right. A white person telling me it only takes hard work and the focus and I can get it is not the same as a black person who went through the same thing telling me, hey, I have dyslexia too. I know that this is hard. Here's what we can do. We're also not going to talk about the fact that black students are more likely to be diagnosed with ADD and ADHD and more likely to be not diagnosed with dyslexia, even though it is a super common thing. I need you to step away from my degree and speak your truth. <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, they have all the stats. Is it is right? Because again, all, watching and seeing my brother and sister, right? We all went to that same Marva Collins school, so we all have that same education. Are all highly intelligent. My little brother would get in trouble all the time. Be sent to the principal's office. Doing the principal's office in 20 minutes, what the whole class did in the entire day. He had ADD and ADHD. Do you know he was in middle school before they finally diagnosed him with dyslexia? They want, they want them on pills. Yeah. They want them on pills. They want them on pills. Yeah, my, on pills. Yes. Our fifth grade teacher, me and my sister have the same one. She's two and a half years older than me. Our fifth grade teacher, well-meaning white woman, called my father. There is privilege in your parent being an educator because they know the system and they'll protect you from the from the predatory nature of the system. She called my father and my mother into parent-teacher conference. My mom loved my dad to speak because she knew he knew the game. She was like, so Jasmine has, I think she may have like ADHD. She has a lot of trouble sitting down and being quiet during class. I think she may need to be on pills or whatever. And my dad was like, Jasmine needs a whoop and she'll be straight tomorrow. Next. Like, <laughs> you're not putting my child on no medication because she's not. St First of all, children play. This is fifth grade, not college. Children play and they talk. So you're not going to put her on pit like, but that like how easy it was for her to try to prescribe pills and diagnose myself. You're a fifth grade teacher. No shade. Teachers are important. But your degree is in education, not in psychiatry. So let's also stay in our lane. Like the boldness with which you try to tell. And if my dad had not been a teacher, she would been she would have been on these pills because we're trained to trust teachers. But you don't always. But sometimes you'd be talking out your neck and with and with unintentional bias. Because who was she talking to? Not her imaginary friend. Are you telling their parents? Their white parents that their child needs to be on ADHD medication. As a person who is now starting to be more comfortable with saying outwardly that I have dyslexia, the shit ain't fun. Because I know y'all have seen me read these comments wrong. It didn't, it kept my sister from reading for the longest time. Like my sister hated books. Like you like. And my sister reads more than me now. Like, but she hated books because it was hard. It was so hard. It yeah. was super hard. And like not acknowledging that things can be hard for people and they are still intelligent is a problem. Like acting like not being a, like not being able to read something doesn't mean that you're not still smart. It just means you have trouble in one area. And we don't teach kids that. We teach them if they have trouble in one thing, they're not smart. I'm sorry. But no, no, no. You're absolutely right. And this is why I get so pissed off when people say audiobooks are not books. If I had access to audio textbooks. Speak your truth, Bree. Oh, my God. If I had what? Huh? I used to dread when they would be like, oh, everybody have to read a paragraph in class, get made fun of, because I'm thinking S's or C's or whatever the fuck I was thinking. Like, if I had access to audiobooks in college, I would have been a bad bitch. I'm talking about bad. Just living. And I say that to say is that, like, in grad school is when I first started being like, 
you know, you need to really start acknowledging that you got dyslexia, like, girl. You just need to go in. Commit, Book will be heavy. Commit to it. And I say that to say I graduated undergrad with a 2.8 and graduated from my master's program with a 3.9. Period. Access. Access. And I'm proud of that 3.9. Like, but Absolutely. First of all, you better be. What? <laughs> what would you mean? <laughs> you better be. What? You can access to a fucking audio book in undergrad? Man. Truly. Truly. And then you have more textbooks in audio form. The fact that when you become a college student, you have to pay for testing to find out if you have one. Because me personally, I feel like this. I feel like if you get tested and you do have one, that part that price should automatically be refunded because you shouldn't just now be finding out. You spent 12 years in school and right. nobody ever saw this. That's a problem. That's a failure of the system. Right. Reparations come in all forms, amen. But I would also no tea, maybe a little tea, maybe a little shade to my mom. It brings me on the topic of black people not acknowledging mm. the health at all in the community because I was yep. literally a, a grad already then graduated from uh college and I'm like talking to my mom and she's just like you still got dyslexia and I was like when when did I have it <laughs> <laughs> what okay. what I was like not you still first of all pause did you think that it didn't go away like I mom like this is I was floored I was floored when she said that to me. Not you, still got like, dyslexia. I said, st- when? Huh? When did we find this out? When did we know this? So I said all that to say, man, I'm in love with audiobooks, and I'll be first set. I'm in love with them. I need Goddess of Jubilation to go ahead and make its way to audio. Oh my God, or I cannot read it. I. <laughs> <laughs> and you're yeah. literally in the same boat. Like, please. Oh, yeah. Audio books have increased how much I finish or read books so much. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, Cashier will tell you, I mean, the other black girl, that's not that's not even my genre. And, and I have a very low threshold for being annoyed, period. But I have a low threshold for being annoyed with people who don't even exist in the real world. So I'm, I'm, I don't like, I forget that completers, is that what they call it? I'm not a completer. I don't feel any sort of anxiety around DNFing. I will Me. DNF you as fast as I will hang up on a spammer. I can <laughs> hang up on a spammer, DNF all in the same flick of my finger. Absolutely yeah. not. I, I not will. Brit, not Brit, your insurance is due. Click. Uh, a tax collector. We're calling and talking to you about the warranty on your 1995. Bruh. Shay Reed is doing well. I talk to her every day. I just want to in on our on our creators. We love that. I definitely FaceTimed her and I was like, so you're ignoring me? <laughs> she goes, I would never ignore you. And I was like, it feels like you were ignoring. It feels like it, it feels like ignoring. It feels like ignoring. Yes, but to all that to say, if 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 the other black girl had not been on audio, I would have DNF'd it in a second. And also, I just wouldn't be able to read. Reading is all I do in grad school. I would not say, "Okay, I'm done with work," and then pick up a book. Like, what's the that? There would be no differentiating that work in my day from like sitting down and like annotating a book and whatever to write about it and then sitting down again to what not annotate this one like i just i would not be able to read i have to have that switch of like when i am studying a book i read it in physical copy and when i am just doing it for enjoyment i i'm just gonna audiobook it now no lot of booktubers are like they're like annotating and reading but that's fine do you I, that's my literal job i'm not gonna hold you if you do it but i'm not doing that for pleasure that's just me that's just me. And I can still have conversations about the themes. Now, 
other nuanced things. I'm gonna have to go back and read the physical copy, but I'm not doing that on read one. And it has helped me read so much more. And also like my eyes, like my eyes caused me a lot of trouble and it's only increased since graduate school. It's only increased since this hot spam sandwich of a pandemic. So I just don't know why I don't have on my glasses that block light. I would not be having this raging headache. Like I really done fucked up and I don't what? know where my glasses at. Where were they? I don't know. Last night I was like everywhere. I was like door to explore around my goddamn house, just really hanging out. And I'm just like, where the hell did it go? I just wanna I wanna pause. Yes. Okay, so I don't make it a secret that me and my dad has had a tremendous relationship. But in the last couple of years it's been really good. So I called him the day joking. And I was like, oh, you care about my nephew, your grandson more than me? I guess I know where your loyalty lies, you know, just joking around. Mm -hmm. So then he got serious. He go, I don't know how you can ever doubt that I love you. Like, he just like, my dad gets real serious emotional. So then I started roasting his toes, saying it looked like they throwing up gang signs. And then we just kept laughing, and then he was roasting me. So then I sent him a picture of me in the process of getting my hair done. And then his response is, you know, I love your crazy ass all day. I won't tell you because you got a big head, but I do love you, baby girl. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> he can be so cute. He's just like, he's like 6'5 and just. We love it. I'm like, he, I talked to him today. He goes, you know, I had to teach your, your nephew how to work out. I said, don't teach my nephew some prison moves. He said, you know, I had to. Yeah, my dad's about this life. I don't make no secret about that. I, I don't make no secret about that. <laughs> on site right. to that man. On site. Right. No words. Man, I, I'm quick to be like, I was the first girl in my family to go to college. Like the first to graduate high school, the first to go to college. My family is very much hood, not adjacent, but hood. hood. Like. Big, big old, big old, like, big deal. Right, like, right, like throw up the big B and whatnot. Like we don't play. So like I, I'm quick to like tell people because like, I remember um, my freshman year, I went to a private university and worst mistake ever. So glad I did not stay there. But I went to a private university and like this dude, like there, I was like talking to this football player and he was talking to me sideways. And I was like, Okay, so I'm gonna have a conversation with you because obviously your mother didn't have this conversation with you. Sweetheart, you are not from here. You could disappear tomorrow and nobody would find you. Stop. I am like one phone call and it, no. So just leave me alone and go. She said, let me, let me let me let me read you your profile. Like, I, just, I really want you to understand. Like you don't, your mother should have told you, don't go to somebody else's town talking noise especially to a woman because you don't know what Who's somebody will do over that woman you don't you know. know you, you don't never know. know you don't know how much somebody loves that person so just don't do it i i think my issue is i've been hanging around in too many white spaces and sometimes i forget and then i go home and i'm reminded quickly you know, so I'm in the room in the white spaces. And I remember one time I left my mom's door unlocked. I still cannot hear the end of it. She goes, your motherfucking daddy is a thug, big T. And you gonna just leave the door? Like she was so mad at me. Not big T. Big T, like, and I, she's like, your dog is a, your daddy a whole gangster. And you just go, and I'm just like. Uh, like, she's not <laughs> real like and it it just it just used to be like I just don't you know there's not a lot of stuff you can say share you know what I mean you know what I mean right of course right you gotta nah but right, the concept but, of not locking doors is very foreign to me right I'm like <laughs> I, I just been hanging around the whites too long you know what I mean yeah. it's like oh Karen and Bob can come in like sure like why not and I'm just like no B you can't. You can't go like even walking around Mardi Gras. My dad's just looking like he's like you gotta know you're wrong. You don't know these people. Like he's just like very. My dad maybe have been incarcerated too long too, but like he 
he ain't nothing to really want to fuck with. Play with. <laughs> He, my brother is He's a giant. My brother smoothly person. told a boyfriend. He was like, "I have been to prison. I have no problem going back. Mess with her if you want to." My dad liked to say, "I can go to jail and be happy." And <laughs> <laughs> be happy, babe. I'm like, no, I don't want no, you there. I don't want that all. for you. <laughs> no, because it's not a good place. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. You are definitely not being rehabilitated, so I definitely don't want you going back. No, we don't need no. round two. Like, no. at all. Every, my dad would say, you always got to pull me out the dark because I'll be like that. Not really like that. No. Come back, come back, come you back. You need to do that. You home, you home, you home. He, he, was like, he was like, everybody keep telling me I'm hood. And I, I ain't up to no good. And I said, look at my baby. Look at my baby. Keep telling me. Like, he always talking about me, but. That man, yeah, big hood, big old, big old, big D. He, he yeah. lives. I'm hanging out with the whites and, and leaving the door open. Man, I'ma leave the door open. I'ma leave the door open. Stuff. Yeah, nah. <laughs> no. I told Cache, I was like, it's been a year of me singing to you now. I, I met Cache like on my like the day before my birthday because I was slipped into her live and it came up and she was like, I want to do a public live. So that's, that's like basically when I met her. I was like, we're, and that, it's not today, it's August 26th. I'm like, we're well, really up on a year that I've been giving you Disney serenades and randomly singing to you. Wow, you're welcome. This is how I know I'm tired. I was like, oh my God, Shane was here and didn't even say anything that whole time. I dissociated. I'm tired, y'all. I got. I was about to say, oh my God, Shay's here. Meaning, it's time oh, for us to wrap this up. It's okay. Right. We're four hours strong. We can wrap up. Right. Shay right. We've been doing this for a minute. Shay is literally right here. My last question to the audience Is there certain topics you want us to expand on? Yeah, I know we I know we didn't get to talk about being in a predominantly white workspace and I know that literary lady um has yes, rocked that out. came out. So I know that's something we should talk about coming yeah. up for sure. You know I am the only black well no, I'm not now. We got two new black people. I've been here three years and it's the first time. But before then it was still always locked. And I got two big dogs. I wasn't caring. My door's gonna be locked. Listen, if I like dogs like that, I would have it. I think about my plant obsession. And I'm like, what y'all going to do? Shake a leaf? A bitch, any. <laughs> What's even funnier is the my uh so my my boyfriend is like six one and he is a very like we live in Oklahoma he's a very he's like big football player big black dark beard everything we love it um but he's Wait, also your current boyfriend my current boyfriend yes 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 my question is so he do have friends but. I don't think they worth anything if I'm being honest. Well, hey, tell the truth. Listen. Like I'm being honest. And he don't think they worth nothing anyways. Like he they 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 friends in the concept of like social I media see. friends. Like I that. See. Like the, he, the only real friend he got is me. Like what? I'm just being honest. We hey, don't the, truth. Truth. Yeah, like, the realest thing. It's the truth. The real. But so we live in Oklahoma and he's a very big, like, you know, Second Amendment person. So, like, he'll come in the house and not lock the door. And I'll be like, why you ain't lock the door? I got two guns. What do I need to lock the door for? Because we black. What you mean? Just lock it. I don't want you to have to use the guns. I just, just lock it. Just lock it. It's just a thing. Like, even knowing that, like, he'll never let anything happen to me. He can obviously protect us. Lock the dang door. Lock the dang door. I'm gonna just go right back to the fact that he is really given everything that's supposed to be gay physically, and then his oh, yeah. super trash. Like that's just hurtful. It is. Yeah, yeah he needs to find better friends. You know, for your friends' sake. Please right, encourage him. Right, for sure. Right. Well, Britt, I don't sure. know how long you've been single, but it's been a minute, and I'm over it. It's been it's been almost my entire life, to be very honest. But I'm 25, so I tell myself that I'm not old like i'm not old i'm like you know for me i'm a professional never known you were 25 
I am. I'm so 25. You came here a baby and you weren't going to tell me? I huh? thought you knew. I had no fucking idea. I thought you knew. Because uh, that's always what like she she laugh about. Because I'd be like, but you are young. And she'd be like, I'm not that much younger than you. And I'd be like, but you... You don't realize five years is a bit is a lot. Yeah, you young younger than me. I'm talking about that's fine. I'm I'm <laughs> kind of over being single, but here's the thing. And I saw it in a in a TikTok or something. It was like, man, I'm tired of being single when a guy walks up, not you. Not you. That's me. I'm not like in theory, I'm tired of being single, but in reality, I am going into my fifth year. In graduate school, Speaking trying to get out in six. I am trying to get this job. I'm trying to have a literary agent before I graduate grad school in the next two years. I'm trying to move. I'm trying to get grounded in that new city and with my church family. I'm trying to get a dog named Professor Sam Wise Gamgee. And here's the, here's the, here's the reality. Man of my dreams, man of my prayers, one that God has built for my spirit. You can't come into my life until I have my dog and my house and my book. I'm sorry. I'm busy. That wouldn't be fair to you. Because I'm not paying you no attention. She said I'm busy. Ooh, I'm busy. I don't care about your dreams or your hopes right now. I'm sorry. And until I can pour that into you, give me, give me three years, maybe four. So like, yeah, I'm like being single, like, uh, but I'm honestly too busy to actually like have another person. It's all I can do with my friends and my writing. So I'm just like, you know, right. I'm in a relationship with the good doctor, with, with Jesus that. Christ, my Lord and Savior. I He's amazing. I keep Deeply in love with him. I keep and honestly, like, like the way people, people acknowledge it, like relationships are a lot of work. And yes. if you've never really been in a long-term one, like, it wouldn't be a good time to start one while you're right. doing what you're doing if you're being right. honest. Like, because it's too steep of a learning curve to have to deal, especially because you're more than likely going to be dating somebody who is used to dating people and has been in relationships. So even that part, like, it's just a lot of work. So I Leave think, me be. hey, it's cool. It makes it sense. Is, it tracks. It's a, it's a lot of it work. Tracks. I'm going to be honest, but this is like the first time in my life that I'm like, I'm ready Sort of, kind of. Okay. When I say that I'm ready, sort of, kind of, I am quick DNF a man. <laughs> Bree. If Does you, it work like that? Can you DNF a man? Let me know. I mean, yes. I. Yes, my very shortest, much so. my yes. short relationship was 24 hours. I don't have time. Yeah, no, for sure. I don't have time. And honestly, the older you are, the quicker it becomes. The quicker you DNF. Because That's you good news for me. Stop. You My see it and you stop. So you don't see it and be like, oh, that was just one time. I'll see if he continues to do it. You see it one time, you're done. Right. The I feel like the like the shorter their time is. Right. Okay. I feel like when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Believe them. Believe, believe them. them. And also, my last relationship, eight years, if I'm outing myself. Um, was eight years ago. And I've been living my life a little bit in between, if you know what I mean. Uh, but <laughs> established eight years ago this man made a comment about my uterus and that i'm not getting any older and i need to settle down and, and have his babies i had no exited the room and the relationship immediately so you thought i was in are you okay i was moonwalking yeah. <laughs> 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 It's going to be a hell no for me. I What? You want to talk to me about? And then I feel like my days on the sites or whatever, everybody's swiping and, and then they swiping and then they swiping again. And then I'm just seeing white men with their fish. Can we, can we talk about it? I'm seeing white men with a dead deer. I, I'm seeing white men who can't quite take the self. I done seen the nose hairs of your ancestors in the <laughs> I'm saying just it's just not really given what it had post to gave. I'm seeing them <laughs> messaging me, I want to have chocolate. Oh no. Oh no. And then I Black. can head on now. Then for me to be like, did you vote and you tell me no? Your response is 
no to voting. And to you. I just don't quite understand. The math ain't quite mathing with me. And it's just, it's just See, not I don't have time for that right now. I really don't. And then the the it's just like the white man is giving a vibe, and then the black man is being like, "You got to be my queen and take care." If you can't wash your own ass, don't ask me to do it. So I'm struggling out here with the whole dating scene because I just keep getting trash upon trash and garbage, and I just don't know how to. You are encouraging me to stay in my season of waiting. You really should. So I'm just over here minding my black business and reading. Books hey, because that's seriously, the I have. I mean, and it's discouraging because you because it. I see a lot of black women in the academy with, and this is just. It's 12, 19. Hopefully most of the people are gone. We can real talk this on out. Most of the black women in the academy are married to white men that I have seen. That's not what I want for myself. And that's fine. You know, to each his own. I don't to each their own. Myself. Yeah, I don't care me myself, but just I just I used to not care, care, but after some experiences, I'm like, and I'm not interested yeah. in doing this for the rest that of my part, life. That part. And I really did not care at first. I was like, oh, I'm down for this world. And then some really, really viciously racist things happened on campus. And it was like, well, maybe I said, I can't have this conversation. I'm, I can't have this conversation. But the higher up you go, the less black men there are. Don't so shut up. That's, you shut up right now. I just, I don't want it to be true. But here we are. And this reality, and I'm like, Lord, I do trust you. But I think can you please is. work this math out? Can you do that, God? You made the arithmetic. Can't you do something about this? But These I, numbers. I feel like there's always like I've, I've had a lot of experiences that wasn't great. So mm -hmm. like I have met black men who have a PhD or have a master's or you know education wise. We'll just talk about education. And still not come correct. One was like, oh, no, I'm never going to. If you're trying to get your PhD, which you break, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. If mm -hmm. you get your PhD, I can't support it. Like, you're going to have what? to like, raise our kids. Oh. I'm just like, why See? do you keep looking at these hips as birthing hips? <laughs> I don't want kids. So you don't? Mm -mm, I don't. Me neither. Oh, my gosh. I don't. I'm good. These are my children. Right here. <laughs> my dog will be my child. Like, that's all I want. I don't want anything or anyone else. I'm good with it. So, okay, yeah. And I've had so many older, and I love these women, mind you, Tell older you, Caribbean you, women you, at church. Wait, well, who are you going to marry? A man who doesn't want children. That's who I'm going to, I'm not going to marry one who does want kids. I just feel like. I don't want my nipples to hang any further than, than, than where they are. They sing songs about me. They saying, do your nipples hang low? Do they wobble to the flow? Wobble to the flow. The time is 12.21 when we get this real talk coming on. I just, I just feel like I don't want it. I don't, I really don't. I Shame really don't. But you are very correct. It doesn't really matter how high up you go, men can be idiots at every stage. It like really? if they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it. And also John didn't have no PhD, but send John my way. No issue with John. Neither did Neil. And me and Neil listen, John wow. can put it. John still <laughs> can get it. Sorry, Shay. She she's gonna get there soon. Oh y'all fine. Y'all are fine. I, I yeah. my I, my experience is just a little bit different. Like so, I just letting y'all talk. With what? Uh, with white men? Or no, more just more so in general. Like I do want kids. Like I do. Like oh, I okay. want kids. Um, Listen, Shay, also, Bree is forever here for you. Yes, I know, love, like love kids and like want to be TT um, Brittany for sure, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and We're more than likely, like, more than likely, uh, because I can't have kids. More than likely, I'm going to adopt. Um, mm -hmm. Like, and, but also that's more important to me than bringing kids into this world, only mm -hmm. because there are already black children in these homes. And so for me, like, I don't know, 
part of me, and this is why I don't ever have an issue with women talking about not having kids, because me personally, if I'm being honest, I think having kids is very selfish. I think it's very selfish, whether people want to like personally admit it or not. It's a selfish reason why you want kids. Um, because you want you something that looks like you make copies of yourself is not so right, right. Well, like, so right, because like you want someone else that you can like mold and choose and watch grow and da, 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 but it has to look like you. Because if you just wanted kids, then you wouldn't just keep birthing new kids, you would take care of the kids that are already here that don't have homes. If it was solely about raising kids, but it's not, it's usually about your DNA and your legacy going and continuing. For most people, that's why they have kids. Okay. Or I, was about, their wrong, huh? I was about to ask a question and you said for most, because I thought you were saying absolute. And no, 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 no. Like so for some people, like like, but for some people for a lot of people, the reason that they want kids has nothing to do with the child because the child isn't here. You don't have any wants or reasons for this child. Everything that you want for this child is for you, for your relationship, for you to have a family, for you to feel these things. Like, so that's what I mean. That it's initially a, per, a very personal and selfish decision. Now, raising your child and doing those things, that's not selfish. You have to be selfless to do it a good job and do it the right way, right? But most people's intentions when they originally start is they have an idea of what their child is going to be like and what they want their child to be interested in. And they want to dress with their child. And these things is why people, they have those. While we give juniors names and blah, 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 we have these thoughts that we want for them. And so for me, like, that's always been why I'm cool when women are like, I don't want to have children. Because again, so many kids in this world that don't have homes. Um, but I, I like, uh, like Brit was like, oh, no, nah, I mean, black dudes date white chicks. I can date a white dude. Like, that's not no issue. When I live in Oklahoma. Yeah, let's that's start there. That's let's start there, right? That's um, Huh? I was like, that's rough. Did I say that out loud? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's true. It's true. Um, like, oh, like a place that's still like, it's not a sundown town, but my family was like, don't go to this town. Still places like that, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. right? So um, it didn't really work out. And I have this issue with being the reason for your racism. So I have an issue with you speak so you talk so good for a black girl. I have issues with that. I have issues with your father being the only person in this room with the college education, but trying to talk down to me. When all the rest of y'all are just as uneducated as anybody else that I know back home. Like I, I just have an issue with that. And I didn't like that. And that was constantly my experience, no matter what. No matter if the dude's family was rich or not rich, if they were white, I was always having this problem. If the parents were educated or they weren't educated, I was having this problem. And for me, the mental health of it all being like, yeah. hey, I already don't have the best family. I don't want to be marrying into another family that isn't the best. And I have yeah. to raise children in this situation where you have no connection to either one of your families. I'm not OK with that. I don't want that. I don't want to have kids in a situation where your family might treat you differently solely because I'm your mother. I don't want those situations. If I can avoid them, I will. And so for me, it's a mental health thing. I know that's not going to make me a great mom. I know that that's not going to make me a great wife. I know that those are situations that I'm going to be internalizing things that I'm not speaking out on because I don't want you to feel like I'm blaming you for these other people in their situations. It's just not a situation I want to live in. And I feel yeah. like for everybody, they have to count up that cost. Some yeah. people are really worth it. Yeah. And I'm totally fine with that. My my thing about dating a white man that scares me, if I'm being honest, mm -hmm. is I think being in a relationship is a very vulnerable thing. Yes. And I just don't want to have that space threatened just in case you might feel a little a little way and want to drop the ER. Brave, so please speak drop, my truth. Your granny want to drop the ER. Oh, it's because she old. Granny getting these hands. 
you know, I am a firm believer in if you're over 18, anything you say can and will be held against you when it comes to me. So, like, I don't care that you're 80. Shut up. Don't say nothing. Then. Don't be 80 running your mouth. I'm sorry. Like, I remember watching that, that McDonald's player flip that lady and everybody like, she was, oh, you shouldn't have done what you did. And people would be hurting y'all when y'all did this stuff. Y'all wouldn't do it so freely. If everybody got knocked out for saying the ER, y'all stop saying the ER. <laughs> Shay said immediate repercussions will solve all of this. Man. Immediate repercussions. I mean, I was joking about grandma. I don't think I could actually. Shay was not. Shay was not. She I'm said, I'm glad you agree. I've been like, at that. Like, mm, not reflexes. Good. If I'm like across the room, I'm not going to jet across the room, but she better not be next to me. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, reflexes just happen. I just, I just feel like karma, but let's see. Grandma called me the ER. What is going on? Hold on. I'm like, man, all the bugs are coming in, and then I realized that I kept my door, my window open. So why would they not? Be mm, not locking doors, not closing windows. Come on, break. Literally not living life right. But I'm just like, so I be thinking about karma a lot. So. If me and grandma is in the same room and she needed to go get some out of the kitchen, and let's say grandma is a cane user or a walker, I might put the walker outside the door of the house and just watch her struggle. That's what I might do. Rather I'm than giving like, her the hands. Versus giving her, I'm like, you ain't getting them chips today, Brenda. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, I know I we do. Like that's that's probably like the only thing I can feel comfortable doing is like preventing her from getting a snack out the fridge. Not preventing. <laughs> you know? I just don't want to do with that. Period. Honestly, like then it's, it's really what you said, Bree. It's like it's so vulnerable, and I. I I just don't want to allow you into that space of I don't trust you completely not to do certain things. And I'm dating for marriage. So I'm thinking about like, could I really see myself doing all the things I want to do with a white man? I don't know. I don't think so. That's just me. Like I, I just, there are just some marital situation like submission listen i don't know that i would want to do anything remotely submissive for a white man i would probably be immediately like you can't tell me what to do and i just don't want to have that energy for you you deserve someone's gonna do whatever y'all agree to do to do but you're not gonna do it with me so for me i'm just like Bree, you need some off for you you need some off for your arms for you get ate up in your own house okay so why you, you say that like you could pass her the dang off maybe i I really did. Did you offer me some cookies that you was cooking to a week ago? So didn't I say I was almost gonna offer you some cookies and wasn't we in private? You just was like, hey, you need some off. You I didn't say do you need. I did say that. You did. You did. You did. I you was saying it like you was about to reach over and grab it and give it to her. And I was well, just, I want her to be taken care of. I do too. I just was I, I just was curious of how it was gonna get there. I was curious, you know, I had to send you the video when we thought the, the pretzel shrank and grew. That's Maybe you true. know about new technology and I yeah. didn't was asking didn't. questions. Okay. I just love this love for me. <laughs> I said. Yes, yes. <laughs> I said somebody had to say. Yes. Yeah, but that's for me. I'm just like they're just. I want to be free in my in my relationship, and I don't think I would feel fully free to do any and everything. Was a question. Like, and I mean, what if I'm feeling a little, you know, sub, and I want to be a little sub? That's what I'm saying. I'm and not gonna submit to you. That's the submission she me on the ass and be like, that's all right, slave. Stop. Listen, I want to explore everything. I'm not going to explore that with you. Like, I'm not kneeling for you. I'm not calling you, sir. If you slap, you wind it That's back. That's a reflex. You might get that reflex. I might forget. 
that we're married oh, and everything's cool between okay. us. So you could forget, but if I forgot with the grandma, it might be something. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Granny is an elder. I have a thing about elders. I do me personally. See, I have a thing about black elders. Because elderly white people are not usually nice, I have seen in my experience. Oh, man. Man, when you say it like that. Yeah, the truth comes out. But still, I'm just saying. I'm going to be. I'm and like I said, I said if she was across the room, wouldn't nothing happen. But if she was sitting next to me, like. I'm just going to give her eye contact and take her walker <laughs> and put it directly outside <laughs> I feel like that would be no even better though. On. Just look you dead in your eye and be like, "Yeah, you're not getting no snacks on on my right, time. You can't do nothing. You and I'm gonna eat your snacks in your face. Absolutely. And they better be your dairy free. Pistachios, they're mine now. They That's better all. Be dairy free because I don't want no repercussions. But I'm definitely. You know, I don't know. Struggle. I think we can acknowledge that elbowing a grown man versus his mother might be different. Maybe. I think we can acknowledge that elbowing a grown man would not be as 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 bad as elbowing his mother. That's what I'm saying. Maybe not for sure. Okay, so here's my thing. Elbowing your man for smacking your booty and me elbowing his mama for calling me to ER, I kind of feel like I'm more justified, but that's just me. But if you slap me on the butt during a But he's your dude. In the conversation, your dude is smacking you on the booty. That's not my fault you chose a white boy. No, my dude is a hater and not listening. My thing is, you don't slap me on the butt and call me slave. Oh, that, yeah. We didn't yeah, say that no, part. Yeah, no, no. You had to say that. Right now, you definitely called me a slave. Period. And you get nailed. No, but you that's what I thought we were saying. That's what I'm saying. I, I said if you slap me on the butt and call me slave. I didn't hear the and called me slave. I thought you were just saying if you were being, if you were subbing for him. No, if I was subbing and we getting into it, and then you slap me on the butt, was like, come on, slave. You oh, that's different. different. Oh, that's you way different. A different role play, that's sir. First of all. Who wants to play slave and master? Right. Why? Who people think I want to do that? Stop coming at me. Well, being a submissive and being a slave are not the same thing. But like, I'm not I'm trying to explore that relationship at all with a white man. I just don't trust it. Is, don't, let's not yuck on people's young. There are certain, what is it, deep, BDSM. BDSM. Right, but like being a submissive and being a slave aren't the same thing. Right, right. I'm cool with BDSM. No, y'all not know what I'm saying. There are parts okay. of that world that have okay. slave master play. That's true. That's true. It's not that's for me, but I won't yuck someone else's young. Saying, but if you're my saying, husband, don't let that be your young. So that's what I'm saying. If I'm dating a white man and he's into that and have done that with other people who are not black, and if he did that, mm. he, he gonna get detained. Yeah. So I didn't like, but really thing, execute though. what I was But here's the thing, though, right? But, like, wouldn't you know that, like, as a white man, that playing that, even though you played it with other people who aren't white, that playing yeah, it with somebody it's a little black tone might, deaf. might I'm, gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you what my father told me a long time ago, and uh -oh. I haven't been able to unhear it. Okay. Not all sense is common and not all common is sense. It's true. That chiasmus will get you every time. Right. I feel like you, this situation couldn't, well, I don't know. It probably, it might have, but I don't think the situation will happen to you only because I feel like you can't know you and not know that wouldn't be okay. Like, I feel like the people who do those in relationships do those in relationships where they know that person isn't going to get mad about something like that. Uh, or they've been they've been swallowing too much stuff like they've been not saying it too much and right. now they're like oh you won't care right if you throw that into the conversation and into the argument i accept what you're saying throw in that it's you right throw in that it's you it is you that we talk about <laughs> i accept i accept yeah uh, I, I accept yeah, no, I, I know any white boy i've ever dated would never uh, ever call me did you just I'm just saying, you what know, you I just don't want to deal with I, it. I don't understand. What was you? 
the hands <laughs> might be given. Right. And the ass whoopings might be taken. Right. The, <laughs> I just don't want to, but you know what? I think it's very interesting that these, I've only seen one series and I'm going to be, no, D.A. Young, uh huh. I've only seen one interracial series actually deal with interracial relationships, one contemporary, like recent, deal with interracial relationships and not unsee the race factor. Like when I read Talia Hibbert and I read um, Alyssa Cole, and Alyssa Cole writes the verses, I ain't got no smoke for her because she writes more than just interracial couples. But I mean, I have, I have recently, after my scuffle with Theodora Taylor, become suspicious of Black writers who only write interracial relationships. I'm suspicious of you. Um, and Shay knows, me and Theodora Taylor were- But Talia well, Hibbert talks about why on her Twitter. I, I believe, I, I heard something about it, that she was like, she was gonna write Black, but something happened or something like that. Is that what it is? Something about publishing or whatever. Yeah, right. Is it, is it one of those things for you, question, that mm -hmm. we talked about Justina Ireland, someone mm -hmm. attacked her, not attacked her, but called her out, and she said, right. I hear you. Moving yes. forward, I'm a new one. New this. <laughs> Who the you know knew me? Who this right? Uh -huh. Natalia, who book after book after book after book after book. Yeah, so I don't give you a repetition. That's an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because now yeah, you have a platform. Now you're Talia yeah. Hibbert, and everyone loves you. Um, who gonna check you, boo? Makes sense. Makes sense. I understand starting off with that. P -p we consider the source, right? We know, but at this point now, it's like, but everyone loves you now. So what's the holdup? That for me, that's what it is. And like for with Theodora Taylor, who Shay knows, I loved her like I love Alexandria House. I was like insta reading all her stuff. But I just saw a trend of one putting black women in relationship to white men who were not even like the best and who really had slave master tendencies number one and then not like really had slave master tendencies where it was like you're just not saying that this is a this is a, this is a sort of master relationship this is not a bdsm relationship y'all not agreed upon this and this is darn near sexual captivity and there were multiple books where I'm generally i mean yes your your body your computer is doing that volume thing again so you oh no can y'all hear me now Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just lower. Like, so you might have to project until it starts working. Okay. Okay. So Theodore Taylor was having like multiple books where they weren't like the white guy wasn't calling it master slave, but that was the, that was the juice. Like that was the taste. That was the flavor that I was getting. And I was like, oh, well, the black woman is into it. But here's my thing. Again, I deal in patterns. You do that one time, I'm not going to be up nobody's gym. If she was genuinely into it, listen, whatever. But that's, that's a pattern across multiple series, number one. And then number two, I rarely see black men in your series. At, and I've read over 10 of her books. Right. I... I rarely see black men in your book. And when I do see black men with any sort of speaking roles, they are brothers of the of the protagonist, a black woman, brothers of the protagonist. Twice that brother is sold to her in two separate series, two separate women in two separate countries. Her brother sold her into sexual slavery. I said, and I'm done. You're not going to keep writing these black men who are trash to their sisters. That feels like anti-blackness and I can't trust you anymore. And so at that point, I was like, goodbye. And so from then, I'm like, I'm just suspicious. Like, what is the motive of you writing nothing but interracial relationships? It feels like anti-blackness after a while. Why must the black woman only and always be with a white man? And then the race never comes up. As like, so you're not gonna like it's all just peaches and berries. There are no struggles. None. Like I don't I don't rock with that. And Alexandra, not Alexandra House, Theodore Taylor would have there be 
some like some some skirmishes. So I was like, oh, like she does interracial relations, but there is some like whatever. But the master slave I couldn't get through, then the trans representation of black men couldn't get it's with that either. Nothing. It ain't matching. Mm -mm. I said someone hurt you, and I don't know what to do about that, but I can't keep supporting this. I gotta put on some cream, man. I got bit by a bunch of mosquitoes like almost three weeks ago and like the oh, scars man. where they bit me still affects me. So maybe I got some uh -oh. skin. Which book was that, Nix? But yeah, I I many problems with Theodora Taylor. I mean she makes really great plots. Like they be juicy, but they are problematic as heck. Yeah. They're problematic as heck, and I'm like, I can't keep giving you this. There's only one of her books. I have one. Of, I have two of her books on Audible. One of them with an Italian guy, who I love, um, and one with um, I think he's in an Indian country. The one with the black man, Theodore Taylor. Listen, with a black man love interest. I've, the only person of color that I've seen is Zahir, who was a sheik. And that was legitimately that what he legitimately like put her in a room, had had his servants take all her clothes away, and literally was like, You're only gonna eat if you eat him. Like literally retrained her. And I was like, Wow. Now if he had been white, this I would never even finish that book. I really like that protagonist. And I like how she dealt with him, but also like that situation was messed up. And by that point, I was just like used to it from her. But after that, that, that next selling into sexual slavery, it was a doctor. I get that. I get that. Okay. I haven't read that one, but Ooh, that's not. My little sister called me 11 minutes ago. Well, shit. Uh oh. Anyway. Well, it is late, Brie. We can yeah, wrap up. She's probably talking about something great. You know, she's about to be 18. She don't know that. Um. <laughs> She just out here why? No, I'm just kidding. She's not. sorry. I'm sorry. She's probably in is it place. that hard to write black love? Listen, Alexandria House makes it look easy, and we appreciate it. Oh my god! Giving us volume, giving series us, upon series, giving us black men with vulnerability and who recognizes it. I, and talk about like to Shay's point earlier, like not like not being afraid to talk about like bad black moms. Her Romy you series. Talk about bad moms, man. Sources of trauma and her Romeo you series. Her catalog, like you, Brit. Oh, I'm deep in it. <laughs> I'm deep in it. <laughs> but she has so many on Audible and Scribd, and like so because it's it's audio. And I I don't know if you've listened to any of her audio of the audio books. Jacoby DM. That's all I do. Jacoby DM can read me a, a, a grocery list. I'm going to have to spend a credit on it. I'm sorry. Wow. So Jacoby DM, Adendrele Ojo, I'm like, in my mind, they really are married by now. Like by now they're just together. Their voices are married. And so I just, I just love them. I just love them. That, and so that's how I get through these catalogs so fast. I said, that was a good black what? What? It was good. What? Uh, we should have one just for Alexandria House. But we definitely, we got to get off this computer box I mean, for the sake of our here. eyes and three sister. I got to go. I have not eaten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. No mm -hmm. I need to go and eat. Um, oh, it's great for black love. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, y'all, people. Oh, that's somebody who we don't talk about enough because I have, like, a bone to pick with that. Uh -oh. Because her husband also writes books, but he does not write interracial couples. They are always both Asian from what I've seen from the book covers and the blurbs. And it's always like, why do you feel like you have to write interracial romance? But your husband, who is an Asian man, does not feel that he has to write it at all. It's a question that has been bugging me for like months. I don't have a problem with her. It's just a like it's a question that I've had, like because I haven't read any of 
like their book or, or like anything like that but it's something that i noticed because oh. the the new one the cover looked good and i was like wait that dude is that dude black or asian he's asian okay he's asian and so they started both pubbing each other coming out and so i started following her husband i was like oh that's dope they both right and so all of her dudes are is always her a black girl and an asian man and i was like oh cool well i bet he does the same thing nope he does not <laughs> but you know what literary lady made a good point and honestly that's that's a question I have for Justina Ireland, a question for Zakia Delala Hair, a question for Tracy Dion. Like all of these only white white guy love interests. I'm like, is that what your life is or something? Like what's going on? I feel that, but I also feel like, are we crying? That's why I never ask, but I'm just curious as to where the pattern is coming from. Like, like is it a pattern that you are pulling into from publishing or is or is or is, is this what are you representing your life here? I don't know. Yeah, and also, I don't think it's private when you crying when you put it out. I never would have known that that was your husband and that you were his wife and that y'all both writers had y'all not shown it. I I didn't I didn't know that. Right? Like I started following you because I heard you are a black woman romance writer. I was excited. And I was like, dang, she don't write any black love. I'll probably check her out one day just not right now and then she starts pubbing her husband i was like oh that's cute now i definitely want to read they both writers and then it's like you are fighting to show that your relationship exists in this world and i think that's awesome but why isn't your partner doing the same thing that's a question for me yeah i mean not a bad one and right. not a bad one at all right like, and i think that like i feel like Sometimes I feel like, and this is just me personally, and y'all can agree or disagree. I feel like sometimes black authors use the excuse of publishing being the reason when we know by now you can have a black love couple and a book still get out. You can have a book with black people around and black friends and the still book still get traditionally published. It's like, the truth is, you don't just want your book published. You want other things outside of that, right? Like, so it's not just about just getting your work out there and people reading your work. It's you want fame or you want these other things and it's not just about sharing your work. So then it's about the white gaze at that point and what mm. they're going to consume. Because if it was just about sharing black stories because black stories need to be read, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be changing the type of stories to fit mainstream. So that's why I'm asking. I'm like, are you like, are all your friends white? Are all your are you, are all your partners white? Like, is that why you're putting this out here? Because I'm like, what? Where is this coming from? Why is this becoming a trend with these black authors? And I mean, debuting ones too. That's part of why Wings of Ebony again, like both the the whole love triangle is black. And I was like, okay. And she said on her Twitter that was important to me. Yeah, she did. I love her Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> And so you're saying, like, like, so someone is saying this. in a fantasy where you don't have to be in a, another country, you don't have to be from an island, you can be a black American and you can still live in fantasy and have magic and then not be a bad thing. I just love how the hoodness just spews through the page. I'm here for that. And then I was just like, oh, I don't want to read the books so only was able to get halfway before I wasn't like freaking out. And then I was like, I'm gonna patiently wait for a um, for a audio book. So then I go to the library yesterday and found out that they got the audio book for Wings and Ebony, Lord Jesus. So I downloaded it. So I'm so ready to finish. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Excited. Anyway, yes. Yes. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> If we don't do it like that, we'll be here for another hour. So we're gonna have to yeah. cut it off just like that. Thank you all for coming. Um, Shay has a list on our other topics. Can we just read them out? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a second. Let me pull. Let me go to the conversation real quick. Damn! I wish the grocery store was still open because I can fuck up some popcorn right now. I'm gonna just boil some eggs. Just call it one. Come on, boil some eggs. Okay, so we're adding uh when I see your name and I keep forgetting that you're here when I see your <laughs> name. Stop doing that. Um, so, 
So we got from tonight, we add, we're we adding uh, being black and white spaces. Yes, hoopla is free for sure. Um, and then we have incarceration of black bodies, specifically um, black men, but we weren't sure if we wanted to is expand that. Um, uh, the intellectual history behind co-opted words created by black Americans and code switching in real life. Yeah, those are the words. I mean, those are the words. <laughs> it's time for us to go those are the topics that we're going to be hitting y'all with yeah. so keep a, a look out we're going to like rotate channels so keep a look out for who's it'll be on next All right. I think you were right I think you said oh, you were oh, next, right? next oh yeah it's me yep that's right so keep it <laughs> keep it out on my channel if you don't follow me on my socials do it's at Brit Riderly on Instagram and Twitter um We'll keep an eye out for that because that's where we'll be pubbing it. Um, but yeah. Hmm. That was weird. I was like. <laughs> All right. I only legitimately mess with three layout buttons. I don't even know what the rest look like. Yeah. Well, good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, y'all. Thank y'all so much for being Thanks here. Thanks so much.